First of all, Jazakum Allah Khair again for having me. And the first things first is to talk to myself for one minute after a generous introduction, which is to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Fatir says, Man kana yuridu al-izzata falillahi al-izzatu jami'a. Those who seek glory, let them know all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you resonate, what you have resonated with over the past three months is not Sami or anything Sami says. What you've resonated with is the justice that embodies the Palestinian cause and your fitra has resonated with the justice that Islam decrees, particularly with regards to Palestine itself. You've resonated with that, not Sami. Allah elevates those who stand for justice, elevates those who stand with Islam, and humiliates those who abandon it, and humiliates those who abandon the cause of Islam. As long as our words are aligned with that justice, you will continue to resonate with what I have to say. And if I was to say something completely on the opposite, you would not resonate with Sami anymore. And that is the greatest proof that what you're resonating with is the cause, not the individual. And all glory belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the highest honor that a servant can achieve is to be a vehicle through which to pursue that justice or through which that justice comes about. I like to think that I may have contributed a little bit in the same way that everybody else here has contributed to it as well. And may Allah always use us as vehicles for his particular cause. After talking to myself now for a minute, I'll talk to you now. <laughs> sometimes when you do this quite often, the message can appear the same. And sometimes you sit at, in the hotel room, and I've seen way too many hotel rooms. I've only been to London for eight or nine days in the past three months. And uh, alhamdulillah, I hope to go to London soon, but apparently it will be a pit stop before I come for another leg, if they let me through the border. Inshallah, <laughs> if, if they hit me through the water. And sometimes, you know, you get comments sometimes where they say, you know, Sami, Jazakallah khair for the videos and, con and for the three months, but bro, we need new content. <laughs> and sometimes I don't know what to reply. I mean, what is it that, that you are getting used to? Is it you, you heard the truth about the genocide for too long and now you want to shake it up a bit? Is it that you got bored of hearing, not you specifically, but those who said it, did you get bored of hearing that children are having their limbs amputated without anesthesia? Did you get tired of hearing about hospitals being bombed and seeing the limbs of the patients dangling from outside dead? Did you get bored of hearing about the babies being slaughtered? Did you get bored of the images of the children wandering around in the streets of Palestine crying out, Mama, Baba, and the nurses have to lie to the child and say your parents are alive when they know full well that the child's entire family have been wiped out. And now there is a new term used by, news, uh, used by refugee agencies and charities about a surviving child with no surviving family members. The fact that the message has to be repeated constantly over and over again shows how deficient the world has become with regards to morality, that we are now 100 plus days in and still we find that we are still witnessing a genocide, live stream, ethnic cleansing, live streamed, slaughter, live stream. Not only that, we're seeing a world that throughout international law entirely desperate to protect this environment in which to allow this genocide and ethnic cleansing to take place. We saw the human rights that they kept talking about for years and years and years as if they were the bastions of human rights. We saw them throw out those human rights because the Israelis happened to be a particular color and they wanted to protect that. And the genocide was being done to a people of another color. And those people aren't necessarily deserving of human rights. We think that the world has progressed, but in reality, it reminds me of 1945 when the French, not that I was alive in 1945, but I'm saying it reminds me of what I read about 1945. In 1945, when the France was liberated from Nazi Germany, the Allies all got together to write a document. And in this document, they wrote that every man is born free and every people have the right to self-determination. And the Allies got together and they patted each other on the back and they said, look how moral we are. Look how wonderful we are in terms of our justice. And then the French, while they were celebrating in Paris, their humanity at having defeated the evil Nazi Germany, while they were celebrating in Paris, they received news that Algerians in Steyf, Kharata and Galma had taken to the streets because they had read this document. And they said, wow, we're entitled to freedom. Wow, we're entitled 
to self-determination. And the French were so outraged that these people believe the document referred to them that in the space of one week, they massacred 30,000 Algerians in the same period after they had just been liberated from Nazi Germany to say to the Algerians, hey, 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 this law, this human rights, this freedom belongs to us, not to you. How dare you challenge France? France is great. You cannot challenge us. And they buried, they massacred. They say 12,000 and they say it without any sort of reservation. We made it as if 12,000 is a small number. The Algerians say 50,000, I went for the middle number, 30,000, so that no one can say exaggeration, no one can say I was too conservative. 30,000 Algerians in one week massacred because they wanted the same rights that Europe at the same time was celebrating when they wrote their document of the Geneva Convention. That was 1945, we are 2024, and exactly the same attitude is being manifested by the free world. Exactly the same attitude is being displaced, displayed by exactly the same people whose grandfathers committed the same massacre that they did in Algeria. And the irony that the same people who committed the Holocaust are now the ones cheering another genocide again, supporting them. Some people are saying it's out of guilt. I don't think it's out of guilt. I think it was a transplanting of settlers who came from Europe. There were, I, don't, I, don't watch, I don't read Reddit. I don't read Reddit. I'd like to go on record. I don't read Reddit. However, I saw this Reddit piece on Twitter. I don't read Reddit. For those of you who read Reddit, you'll know exactly why I'm saying I don't read Reddit. I saw it on Twitter. They said that an Israeli settler took an ancestry test. Now, I did the ancestry test. And alhamdulillah, I discovered that I am about, I think it's 20% West African, uh, about 30% North African, about 35, 40% Arabian Peninsula. I think there's a couple, maybe 2% European in it, but we don't need to talk about that. In any case, <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong. Astaghfirullah, there's nothing wrong with it, mashallah. So, <laughs> so a settler in Israel took an ancestry test and they found that they were 100% Eastern European. And so they put on, they said, guys, I think there's something wrong with the test. Can someone help me? And then someone wrote on top, is anybody going to tell him? <laughs> The reason why I mentioned the idea of the settler colonialism is because before the settlers came from Europe, Jews and Muslims were living side by side in Jerusalem for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Every time the Europeans got involved in the issue, they would turf the Jews from Jerusalem. And the Muslims would say, you can come back. Umar al-Khattab said it. Then the Christians would come again. Europeans, white supremacist Europeans. They would massacre, kick out the Jews again. Salahuddin Ayyubi would turn up. He wouldn't commit any massacre of the kind, but tell the Jews, come back. Anti-Semitic white supremacist Europe that committed the Holocaust in 1945, it's almost as if there's a muscle memory when it sees what's happening in Gaza. There's an excitement, but it doesn't know where their excitement is coming from. We've seen this before, and we enjoyed it before. Why should we stop it, guys? This was so fun when we did it. Germany is going all out to say, go, 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 do this genocide. Some people said out of guilt. I don't think it's out of guilt. So, yeah, Ibad Allah, if you are bored with the same message over and over and over again, know that you're not bored of Sami. You are bored of the call of justice. You are bored of da'wah. Perhaps you are bored of the 1,400-year-old message of the Qur'an. It's been the same for 1,400 years. Never been changed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the message eternal. Because the message of justice is eternal. For ya ibadullah, I will give the benefit of the doubt and say that what these people are really suffering from is fatigue. Because justice is hard. Justice is difficult. Justice requires struggle, requires perseverance. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went 13 years in Mecca being persecuted in da'wah. No army, no money, no control over the media. His Sahaba being beaten up. By the Kaaba, somebody came and put animal organs in front of him. Some say on top of him. Bilal and Barabah put on the floor with a rock put on the top of him. Sumaya radhi anha killed before the Prophet ﷺ could even give da'wah in public. Boycott. Khadij radhi anha dies during the boycott. Abu Talib dies during the boycott. 
Some of the Muslims have to flee, it gets too much, they have to go to Habasha. So after 13 years, they suffered 13 years, trying, struggling 13 years for justice. Remember before the Prophet said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, he was living a nice, comfortable life. For 40 years of his life, he had no problems with Quraysh. They called him Sadiq, they called him Amin, they called him trustworthy, they loved him, they would leave their property with him. He was like a spoiled child of Mecca, they loved him. Spoiled, not, not in a negative way. Spoiled as in they loved him so much that they would treat him very well. When did the problem start for the Prophet Muhammad When he stood up and he said, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah, why do you bury your daughters? Why do you abuse your neighbor? Why do you treat each other badly? 13 years of that suffering, 13 years of the same message, over and over and over again. 13 years, but Sahaba, they don't get tired of the message of justice, even though they're hearing it from the same person over and over and over again for 13 years. And after 13 years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give him the ability over Quraysh. He tells him to leave Mecca, leave and go to Medina. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is so heartbroken that even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered him to leave Mecca, as he leaves Mecca, he turns around, looks at it and says, Wallahi, you are the dearest land to me. And Wallahi, if your people had not driven me from you, I would never have left you. The Prophet is in tears, heartbroken, that 13 years of giving da'wah and struggling, and those 13 years end with him having to leave Mecca, to flee in the night, when the night when they tried to kill him, and to flee being chased by Quraysh, who are desperate to kill him, and he has to hide in a cave, and Allah sends the spider and the bird's nest in order to try to throw off the scent from those who have chased him. 13 years, the Prophet said, never tires of this message. So, Ya Ibad Allah, for those who are tired of hearing it, beware what you say. Keep it as I'm tired of Sami. Don't say you're tired of the message. Because getting tired of me is no problem, that's perfectly fine. You know, sometimes you hear it, you know, when you're in a marriage, you know, sometimes I'm tired of seeing your face. Class, yeah. <laughs> in, in any case, to the issue at hand. So after thinking very deeply about how to convey a message that you've already probably heard many times over, I've decided that instead of mixing it up, we'll do the same message again. And barakallahu feekum for tolerating it. Because Allah said, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَةِ Remember, for remembrance benefits the Muslim, take it or leave it. In terms of where we, are, where we stand at this moment in time, Haritz reported four or five days ago that Israel has proposed a two-month truce with Hummus. And Hummus are now considering the details, so I have to be careful of it, you know, just, just you know, tolerate it for now. <laughs> the ICJ also delivered a historic moment that will go down in history. Now I've seen many people say that the ICJ failed miserably because they didn't call for a ceasefire or something like that. Ibadullah, did any of you even think for a second that the ICJ could stop the war or the genocide? That wasn't what Israel was concerned about. That wasn't what Genocide Joe was concerned about. The views expressed by the speaker are the speaker's own and do not reflect those of the organization. They belong to Sami alone, and please do not consider any reaction from this audience. Anybody who celebrates what I say has also nothing to do with the organization or anything. They didn't ask me what I would say. I didn't tell them what I would say. This is a serious disclaimer, despite the reaction of this audience, which I have nothing to do with. I'm going back to London. They're the ones who will have to decide who comes into power afterwards. It has nothing to do with me. And no, I'm not moving to the US. <laughs> it's too far to fly everywhere. SubhanAllah. I flew from Dallas. So initially, when I came to America in November, and I landed in, on the West Coast in LA, and you all know the story by now, I landed dressed for London weather, cold London. I see five days of summer a year, just so you know. I see the sun five times a year, and I don't even see them in one go. You know, it's different. It comes at separate days. So imagine my reaction when I've flown 11 hours. And not only that, they made me fly London, Istanbul backwards three hours, and then fly 13 hours, 13 and a half hours, to Los Angeles. When I landed in Los Angeles, the pilot says, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Los Angeles airport. The weather is clear skies, sunny, and it's something, something Fahrenheit, because we deal in Celsius, because we're sophisticated, not the... I know America likes everything big. I think maybe you didn't like the idea of 26 Celsius, so you had to make it 70 or 80 something, you know? Everything has to be big, you know? 
your chick, your that bid'ah of yours, chicken and waffles has to be big. The portions have to be big. Everything has to be big. You know, your roads are big. The cars are big. So, <laughs> so when I landed in lovely sunny LA, I stepped out and I looked out and I said, Allahu Akbar. This was 25th of November, 26. So winter. I said, Allahu Akbar. I never knew winter could look like this in the world. Allahumma, I would never spend winter anywhere else. But I didn't truly appreciate how big America was until some brothers of mine, who I reluctantly call friends, because they invited me and they said to me, Sammy, we heard you're in America. Would you like to visit us in Chicago? I haven't finished the story yet. Now, I, I, I'm not used to coming to America. First time I came to America was 2018 for a wedding. And even that was the East Coast. That was only six and a half hour flight, like Adi. My friend found a Yemeni in Raleigh and he wanted to marry her. And I told him, yeah, out of this big world, you couldn't find somebody except in America, yeah. And then, of course, I had to go and apply for the visa because Obama introduced a Muslim ban. So because of Obama, Burak Hussein Bu'amama, as we called him when he first came to power, and then we just now say Barack Obama because he betrayed us so horribly. <laughs> Barack Obama listed a, sets of, a number of countries that if you've been to them, you have to go to the embassy to apply. And I'd been to Sudan in 2013. Beautiful, lovely Sudan that is now in the middle of a war because the UAE and Washington said, if we hold elections, Sudanese will choose parties that align too closely with the idea of Islam. Bin Zayed, the head of the U president of the UAE, told Jake Sullivan, according to New York Times, this isn't my word, and the views expressed are the speaker's own, and this view is the New York Times view as well. It's not the view of this organization. But they wrote in the article, The Dark Prince of the Middle East, that Mohammed bin Zayed told Jake Sullivan after the Arab Spring that these are a people in this region, in this Middle East region, these are a people who believe a 1,400-year-old book should be a constitution. Do you really want these people to choose their leaders? And Jake Sullivan later said, we turned out bin Zayed was more right than not when it came to these affairs. When Sudan, Omar al-Bashir's government was toppled after 30 years of sanctions, those Sudanese, if anybody's Sudanese here and says revolution, all greatest, greatest of respect, there's no revolution in 2019. Yes, there were protests, but not revolution. Protests took to the streets, large protests. UAE got excited, Washington got excited. Salah Ghosh, the head of intelligence, took the opportunity. So did the general Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, so did Himeti. They got together, they said, let's ride these protests and toppled the al-Bashir regime. And then when the people thought that they did a revolution and they demanded elections, they very soon got a rude awakening that not Washington, nor Abu Dhabi, nor Riyadh believed that they did a revolution. The Riyadh, Abu Dhabi, and Washington came together with the generals who had toppled al-Bashir, with leftist civilian parties who knew they would never win an election, and they made a deal. They said, guys, look, if we let the Sudanese have an election, we'll get the same result as Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and all these other Arab Spring countries, where in Tunisia, after 90 years of top-down secularism, the Tunisians still chose Islamic-leaning parties. They didn't vote Muslim Brotherhood. Muslim Brotherhood were the beneficiaries of a people who were inclined to Islam, which is why today, when many Tunisians believe the Islamists abandoned the principles of Islam, they still love Islam, even if they don't love the Islamists. Very two separate different things here. They said, if we hold elections in Sudan, then they will vote for people similar to how the Tunisians, the Egyptians voted. So they came up with a deal. They said, let's negotiate a transition. The generals who toppled al-Bashir after 30 years of sanctions, you can rule for two years. And the leftist parties who would never win an election, we will give them 69% of the parliament appointed so that they can embark on the ideological changes that the Washington wanted and for which it imposed sanctions to achieve. In those two years, the leftist parties and the general together, they removed Islam from Sudan's constitution as part of a deal with rebel groups. They normalized ties with Israel, knowing it would never happen democratically. Then in 2021, when the general was supposed to hand over power to the leftist parties, he turned around and he said, guys, come on, these parties would never win elections. I want to rule. Okay, listen, if you don't let me rule, I'll hold elections. And they told him, no, 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 no elections, please, please. Ta'ala, let's negotiate again. Let's make a new agreement. We'll call it the framework agreement. The general said, okay, let's negotiate. They negotiated for a year 
at the end of the year, the general said, I still don't like this agreement. I don't want to hand over power to these leftists. He went to Egypt and he asked Sisi, can you help me out? Sisi said, sure, I don't want UAE to have a lot of influence. So they expanded the participation of the civilian parties. UAE got frustrated. So did the leftist civilian parties. So they asked the head of a militia, Himmeti. They said to him, Burhan lives two streets down from you. If you could go in the middle of the night, do you think you'd be able to assassinate him? He said, sure, no problem. So he goes two streets down, Burhan gets a tip off, the general runs away, and then the whole country is plunged into war, and the UAE is so dead set on Sudan not choosing that it would rather support a militia that is committing genocide in Sudan than allow the Sudanese to have any elections to choose their leaders, because these are a people who believe a 1400-year-old book should be a constitution, and therefore they should never be trusted to vote. That's Sudan in a nutshell. I had been to Sudan in 2013 and I loved it, which meant I had to go to the embassy to apply for my visa. And I didn't want to go and apply for my visa. And my friend told me, why? I told him, I can't come to your wedding. He said, why? I told him, because I don't want to go to the American embassy and ask them, please, can you let me in your country? I told him, I feel it's beneath my dignity, yeah, like, you know? Allah said, we, go, we, we gave man dignity. Why should I throw away my dignity? He goes, you throw away that wretched dignity of yours and you come to my wedding. I told him, Akhi, I'm, not the one, I'm not the one who chose an American to get married to. You could have brought her to Birmingham and get married to her in Birmingham. Why should I go to America and tell them, please, for what? For a wedding, yeah, for you? He said, yes, for me. So no, I'm not going. He told me, you'll go. Anyway, I told him, you want me to stand in the queue in an American embassy and then go to the window and tolerate that interview process. He said, Wallahi, if you don't go, this will be firaqun bayni wa baynik. This will be the end of our relationship. Because there are only eight people coming from the UK and there are 400 of her lot. <laughs> So I thought, yalla khalas, let me make engineer it so that they reject me. That way it won't be my fault. Why would I want to go to the eye of Sauron? You know, like, like I, don't, I don't understand it. Why would I want, I like why? You know, I have no ragba, I have no desire to come to America. I did it at the time. Now I've grown to love the country, to be honest. But in any case, Allah ibarak. So when I went to the interview, of course, you got, I prayed Fajr and I went. I, I booked an early appointment for some reason. I went and stood in the queue in the cold in London, because we have five days of summer, if you remember. And I went in, stood in the queue, I went in, and I said, yeah, is, is this friend really worth all of this? And then I went to the guy in the interview. Now I know on the West Coast, you guys have this, because when I came to LA, I went in the morning to go to a cafe. And when I went to the cafe, I realized, like, to be honest, West Coast people are a bit too happy. So for example, like, you'll go in the morning, and then somebody's jogging past, he goes, hey, how are you? Good morning. And you're like, oh, Allah. Oh, did I say something? You're continuing. Just go on your way. Why are you so happy so early in the morning? West, East Coast people are a bit more similar to us Londoners, to be honest. East Coast is like, hello, what do you want? So I went to the interview. The guy tells me, what's the purpose of your visit? Allah. That's the beginning of the hurting of the dignity. I'm going for a wedding. Where? Raleigh. How long are you staying? Not a second longer than I need to. <laughs> I didn't actually say that. I didn't have the nerve. <laughs> I said, I was staying for 10 days. I said, okay, what do you do? I told him I'm a risk consultant. He said, what's that? And by this, I thought, you know what? This is a bit too much, yani, saraha, yani. I don't need to go to America, yani, saraha. I don't need to go through this process, yani. Sa you know, my grandfather was a mujahid against the French, you know, in the mountains, kicked out the French. If he was alive and he saw that, he'd tell me, ikhsa alik, shame on you, you know, denying it. So I said to him, you know what? Google Sami Hamdi. <laughs> Some fire. He said, what? I said, Google Sami Hamdi. I thought he was going to tell me, no, I'm not. He said, okay. <laughs> I said, I was quoted in Fox News yesterday. I didn't actually give a quote to Fox News, so don't judge me. I had given a quote to Al Jazeera, and they had taken it on Fox News. So he went, because he looked a bit right-wingy as well, whatever that means. So he goes, chuk, 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 chuk. oh, yeah, you were quoted on Fox News. And Breitbart, oh, and he looked happy about Breitbart, which to be honest is not my proudest moment. But I never gave them, a, I, I didn't give a quote to Breitbart, they watched the El Jazeera and then they took it. And then he said to me, well, welcome to America. <laughs> In my heart, I almost said, I just need to buy a MAGA hat and I'll be able to go through the board every time, subhanAllah, you know. But... So, because of Obama, I had to apply for a visa and the like and the Muslim ban and, and whatever. So, when it came to the... With regards to Sudan and with regards to America and then Gaza and the like, the reality is that when it comes to this process of the ICJ ruling that many Muslims are now saying that we 
are upset because it didn't call for a ceasefire. Ibadullah, you're looking at it the wrong way. The ICJ was never supposed to call for a ceasefire. The ICJ was never supposed to stop the genocide. The reason the Israelis were so worried about the genocide, about the ICJ ruling, is because the ICJ has decided that Israel is going to stand trial for genocide. Something that was unthinkable five months ago. Some, who would it imagine five months ago that you could even question the foundation of the Israeli state? Who would have thought five months ago that Israel would be on trial at an international court for genocide and not even genocide Joe would be able to get Israel off the hook? That not any of Israel's allies would be able to get them off the hook. For the next five years, Israel is going to be dragged through an international court being accused of genocide. That means, you know when companies go to invest in Israel, usually, you know, part of my job is due diligence. I have to investigate a company to make sure that they don't have any red flags. So a bit of a spy, a bit mission impossible, but the more, the nerdy version. So, <laughs> you got, 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 have to get corporate documents and find out who owns what, the shares and that kind of stuff. And, and then you make a decision, this person had a court case, this person had whatever, that kind of stuff. That means when companies now do work in Israel, they have to be careful they don't work with companies that might be implicated in genocide in the ICJ. Because if they do so, then the ICJ rulings are recognized in the UK and also recognized in the US. That means any Muslim can raise a case against any company that works with the Israelis in the UK and the US, and the judge would not ask whether they have jurisdiction, the judge would judge it because the ICJ has already given jurisdiction, which means companies will be less inclined to even invest in Israel. It's a hit on Israel with regards to genocide and a hit in terms of the economy. The views expressed by the speakers, and I have no idea what these guys are doing. <laughs> you got to be careful with these things, you know. Hold it in. The US's immediate reaction was to employ its spin and PR. Now, for the, to understand the spin and PR, it's important to remember that New York Times and CNN have gone from being media companies to PR agencies. I'll give an example, just so nobody thinks I'm exaggerating. I'm not speaking emotionally, I'm speaking seriously. For example, you, if you remember the, the IDF bombed the Jabalia refugee camp and they killed 400 Palestinians. Now, when they killed 400 Palestinians, the IDF said openly, we did it because we wanted to target a Hummus commander. And then they said that after the bomb, we're not sure that we even killed the Hummus commander. Which kind of makes sense. When you have the pita bread, sometimes it's easy, hard to get all the hummus on top. Right? <laughs> it's important to use the correct terminology to make sure that Google algorithm or YouTube algorithm doesn't censor anything. When the IDF commander went on CNN, the CNN presenter asked them, what happened in the Jabali refugee camp? And the IDF guy says, we bombed it. And the CNN presenter is shocked. For 10 seconds, he forgets to ask the question. He's a renowned Zionist presenter as well. So then the Zionist guy, you know, says, uh, the, the CNN presenter says, are you sure? He says, yeah, we bombed it. He said, but 400 people were killed. He said, collateral damage. And the CNN presenter goes, we'll, we'll go to the, the next interview. You know, like, this is good. Then CNN, they got together and they said, guys, look, we know the IDF did everything, but we know their PR is poor. Is there any way we can repackage this? They said, yeah, sure. We won't say that Israel bombed it. We'll just say explosion at Jabalia refugee camp. And the New York Times said, yeah, haram alaykum. What kind of PR is this? Blast at the Jabalia refugee camp. I remember BBC, they had a Palestinian in London. She lost 40 members of her family in Palestine. And the BBC, they showed their sympathy. They said, Palestinian Londoner, loses 42 family members. So somebody joked and said, let's send out a search party to find out where, they, where she lost them. The point is that we see that PR in terms of what's happening. So CNN and the New York Times, when it came to the ICJ ruling, the PR machine went to spin the ICJ ruling as saying that they didn't find Israel guilty of genocide. John Kirby gave a press conference in which he said, the ICJ ruled that Israel is not committing a genocide. The ICJ ruled that there's enough evidence to show they committed a genocide and they should stand trial. But to be honest, I have to give it to John Kirby because I think what he did was very American. And I explain why. I noticed with Americans, you guys are very good at branding. You see, in my hotel room, I, decided, I was looking, going through the guide channel and I saw football. So I thought, fantastic. And I saw a bunch of men holding a ball with their hands, throwing the ball with their hands, catching the ball with their hands, throwing it with their hands, 
running, catching it with their hands and touching down with their hands. And they said, goal, American football. And I said, Allahu Akbar, the branding is so powerful that they think this is a hand and they market it is. And they think this is a foot and they marketed this as football. And no one asks how. It's like the emperor with no clothes. No one wants to tell the American Football Association that there's no feet associated with their game. So I understand when John Kerr... <laughs> Yeah, they have the kicker. They always give that caveat. Because there's one phase of the game, one phase, one in which they kick the ball, they said Allah. It's like when we play soccer or football, you know we have the throw on. Because we have the throw on, we should call it handball. That's the logic that it follows over here. So when I see John Kirby, you know, doing the semantic gymnastics, I think it's a very American thing to be honest. You know, the, the rebranding of genocide as something that's minor or the like. Netanyahu, of course, has accused the ICJ of being anti-Semitic because every criticism of Palestine is anti-Semitic. You know, even if you put a Palestine label on Hamas, it's anti-Semitic because, you know, it's a... The point here being is that the ICJ ruling has rattled the US, it's rattled the Israelis, it's rattled the Allies. Why? Because as this case continues, the judges will ask the question about how genocide was made. And they will pursue the road of who provided the weapons for this genocide to take place, and they will find that genocide Joe is the one who provided weapons. Not only that, the court will discuss over the next five years why Biden decided to, off to go to Congress and ask for $14 billion to give to Egypt and Jordan to take in Palestinians in order to facilitate the displacement. Something which is quite extraordinary when you think about. So when I went to sunny blue sky, sun, sunny LA, of course, it's my first time in America. 2018 was my first time. And then I came again in November, and to finish off that story, when I landed in blue sky, sunny LA, again, remember the brothers, they asked me to come to Chicago. Now I thought that your domestic flights is like Europe. I can go to Paris in 35 minutes by plane, or two hours by train. I can go to Germany, to Frankfurt, one hour 15. I can go to Croatia, Zagreb, in two hours. I can go to Istanbul, the length of Europe, in three hours. So when they told me come to Chicago, I didn't know the geography of America very well. I said, Adi. They were like, we'll pay for your flight. Bismillah. When they sent the ticket, the ticket says estimated flight time, four hours. I thought maybe something wrong with the ticket. What do you mean four hours to fly just to Chicago? And that's a domestic flight with no TV on the plane. They give you this basic package of we have free Wi-Fi. You can access the Wi-Fi and watch on your device. But there are no ports to charge your phone. My phone dies in an hour. And this is the worst part. May Allah forgive them. Even though I love them. I love you guys. Wallah, I do. And when I came to Chicago, I, I came to see you as well because I didn't want to leave Chicago without seeing you. Listen, in this, you did me wrong. I took off from sunny blue sky, LA. And I said, oh, thank you so much, West Coast, for this beautiful treatment for a London. I didn't realize how starved I was of the sun until I saw you in November. And wallahi, I will bring my family here because they need to see this, even if it's a long flight. And I took off and I said, how wonderful America is, how beautiful America is, how sunny America is. And then... As we're approaching Chicago, the pilot says, we've begun our descent, please put your seatbelts on. And I'm like, I can't see Chicago. <laughs> Why are there so many clouds? And you can't see anything. The plane is in the clouds, jumping through the turbulence, you know, like, and you're like, oh yeah. And then while we're in the clouds, the pilot goes, you can hear the wheels go, Drrr, and the pilot goes, camera crew preparing for landing. You're like, what do you mean prepare for landing? I can't see anything. And then literally maybe 30 seconds before we hit the runway, Chicago appears and it's miserable. <laughs> I step out of the airport, the brothers they say, Sammy, welcome to Chicago, we're so happy to have you here. And I'm the kind of person who puts his foot in his mouth sometimes, I, I won't lie to you, you know, like I'm not, I'm not I can't, sometimes I'm not dignified in these things. So I walked in and they say, well, Sammy, welcome, and I said, Wallahi, brother, Saraha, yani, haram alaykum, shame on you, yani. <laughs> they were like, what do you mean? How can you pull me out of LA to bring me to this place? for something we could have done via Zoom. <laughs> Subhana, Subhana, I could have, you could have told me to come to Chicago first, then LA, and you know, I'm used to, just to give me a taste of that. Oh, and then, 
In any case, the point of the story is when I landed in LA, we're talking about the $14 billion that Congress, that Biden asked Congress to displace, that will be investigating the ICJ over the next five years. And it's important that you keep talking about Palestine so everybody remembers it. Because the only reason the court was brought, that the, the case was brought to the ICJ, is because the Ummah was so loud, they shifted public opinion, and that's what galvanized people to mobilize, including the South Africans. God bless them. We have so many Muslim countries, so many Muslim governments, so many constitutions that say La ilaha illallah, so many masajids, so many imams, so many wonderful taraweeh prayers with thousands of people praying in these masajid, not a single one of these nations thought of bringing the case to the ICJ. It took South Africa, a non-Muslim state, in order to bring it forth. And may Allah reward them, and I'll tell you why. Because South Africa knows what apartheid feels like, and so they recognize apartheid when they see it done to the Palestinians. And also the South African apartheid movement, the Muslims played a major role in supporting Mandela. They were among the leaders as well, because the South Africans know that when they were going to, in order to fight back against their apartheid, they knew that their warmest allies were the Muslims as well, who were also South Africans, who were with them in their ranks, who suffered with them, were imprisoned with them, and mobilized with them. And the South Africans recognize that, and they know the relationship relationship between the Muslims and South Africa is one of one body and that's why mashallah they are standing for the Palestinians as the Muslims once stood for South African apartheid they once stood for South Africa against apartheid as well and this alhamdulillah rabbil alameen shows you that when you do a good deed it comes back to you alhamdulillah rabbil alameen back to my story of LA so I land in LA and of course it's my second time in America after having gone to see the East Coast and gone to see Raleigh. And I enjoyed Raleigh, to be honest, but I won't lie to you. And I enjoyed New York. You know when you land in New York, I can't lie to you, you know. I'm sure everybody has the same feeling. You enter and Alicia Keys is in your head. <laughs> yeah, concrete jungle. So anyway, you go in, and then when I flew from New York and the plane took off, I can't lie to you, the plane took off and I said to my friend Tayyib next to me, if I never come back to America, I don't think I would regret it. That was before I came to the West Coast. So anyway, I came to LA and of course inside you feel like a five-year-old. You want to go see the sights of, you know, where you saw in the movies, you know. I watched Beverly Hills Cop growing up, so I wanted to go see Beverly Hills. So I, went, I wanted to go see, you know, Hollywood. You know how they have this wooden sign, H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-O-D. And I don't know why. It shows the American branding. It's just how, how many letters? H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-O-D. It's nine letters on a hill in a random place in LA. But the branding was so amazing, I had to go and see it. So I drove, because in LA, you have just an hour to get to every place, our freeway, and the freeways aren't free, it's always traffic. So you go one hour, and I went up and I saw it. Then I went to Beverly Hills. When I got to Beverly Hills, I was stunned, because I saw tents lined up in this very rich area. And I said to my friend, what are these tents? And he said, homeless people. I said, may Allah help them, there's only about 10 tents. Then I went, there's this area, I think it's like a parking lot, or maybe like a former station, subway station, and it's loaded with homeless people. Biden said to Congress, that, okay, we have homeless people, but is that really a priority when we have the chance to fund genocide and ethnic cleansing? Come on, guys, we have 14 billion. We have the chance to fund, to, to solve the homeless problem, or to fund genocide and ethnic cleansing. Is this even a debate, guys? I need 14 billion to fund ethnic cleansing. When I was in Raleigh in 2018 to go for the wedding, we were in the car and the bride's brother-in-law started vomiting in the car. Now, I want to tell you something about how great my lovely city of London is and my great nation of the United Kingdom. God save the king. <laughs> If I wake up one morning and I go, <coughs> it felt funny. <clears throat> I'm sure there was a chestiness to it. Sumaya, to my wife, I think uh, just go to the doctor and ask the doctor and get your peace of mind. Okay? And I do this. I promise you, I know it's very strange to you guys, but I call the doctor. Doctor, I cough this morning. What do you want me to do about it? I need to see you. Why? I think it's serious. I have a space uh, one week from now. Yeah, that'll do, that's fine. But it might get serious in the next couple of days. Can we do an e-consult online? Yeah, sure, we can do an e-consult. Okay, on the e-consult, you exaggerate. <coughs> so he sees you the next day. 
So he says, you have to come in. So you go in. Now, listen, I know it's foreign to Americans, but this is genuinely how it happens in the UK. So you go to the doctor and you go, doctor, I coughed. He says, show me how. And you go, <coughs> and the doctor says, there's nothing wrong with you. I told him, check. He goes to me, there's nothing wrong with you. I told him, doctor, I mean this with the greatest of respect. I asked Sheikh Google. And I think it might be cancer. <laughs> And I want to get it early so that it doesn't get worse. He tells me, get the hell out of my room. I tell him, am I fine? He goes, you're fine. I get peace of mind, right? Over a cough. God bless the National Health Service. And may Allah protect it from those Tories who are trying to defund it and get rid of it. Say, Ameen. I know you guys don't have it, but you don't need to be jealous about it. You can say, Ameen, so that it can be protected for people like me, okay? So we're in Raleigh, and the brother starts vomiting in the car. When he vomited in the car the first time, his face goes green. We're like, Akhi, as I did with my <coughs> Akhi, let's just go to a doctor and check it out. And he's so horrified by the suggestion, he vomits again. <laughs> he actually did vomit again, but not at the suggestion. So we have a couple of doctors with us, a Palestinian doctor, Omar Abdel Hadi. Allah yathkrub khair. So Arab the head, he goes, listen, like, he does a bit of what I did with the Google. He goes, it might be meningitis. You need to at least go check out just in case. And I went, yeah, it might be men in, men in what? Men in, meningitis, yeah. And I Googled it to make sure what it was. It looked serious. So he vomits the third time. And he actually did vomit the third time. I'm not exactly. He vomited the third time. And then we were like, you know what? Forget it. Oh, it, was, what did it. We have 999, but you guys, you have to be funky. So you do 911, right? So 911, and he said, no, no. And all the Americans went, no, no. And we British went, what, what? <laughs> Don't call the ambulance. Why, Yechi? No, no. And one guy went, here in America, you got to pay. Yechi, he's stingy over $100. Dude, they ate $100 to get an ambulance, Yechi. <laughs> Biden, when he went to Congress, he knows about the healthcare problem. Biden said, I have $14 billion in Congress. There's homelessness, there's healthcare. Congress, you know the priorities. We have a choice between homelessness, healthcare, and genocide and ethnic cleansing. No brainer. We fund the ethnic cleansing. Makes sense. Problem is, however, that the Gallup poll comes out on the 26th of October, which shows that Biden is behind in the polls. And in particular, in six swing states that just so happen to be the swing states where Muslims have the deciding vote. Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Michigan, Michigan. So everyone gets upset when I say Michigan. I'm like, why do you want to be so French and pronounce CH the way the French do? Do you know what the French did in Algeria? What's wrong with you? So Michigan, Arizona, <laughs> and there are two other states. I thought you were laughing, I'm serious. <laughs> in any case, <laughs> I went to uh, Strasbourg once, and you know, I, I speak French. Unfortunately, but in any case, a colonial hangover. So I thought, you know what, I'd go in and I'd practice my French as well. So I go in, and this is what sometimes, you get this experience when you go to France. So for example, if you were to speak Arabic, a non-Arabic speaks Arabic, how would the Arab person respond? MashaAllah! Well, sometimes. Because I remember, no, no, to be honest, I take it back. Arabs don't respond that way. Because in my hometown in Sidi Bouzid in Tunisia, we had a Chinese guy arrive once, and he walked in and he spoke the best Fusha I've ever heard. He went into the market and he went, Hayakumullah. إني أريد قطعة من الخبز وبعض من الطماطم و... and the, the guy goes, he goes I want a bit of but very poetic I would like a piece of bread and I'd like some tomatoes and whatever and Muhammad and the shopkeeper sitting there with his paper went شينوي يهدر عربية the Chinese speaks oh, Muhammad come in here hey hey every guys hey, hey, say it again say it again say it, say it how you said it Allah, Sadaq Allah Azeem, Sadaq Allah Azeem. <laughs> and you're like, guys, have some shame. What's wrong with you? When I went to France, I had this, not, not the same experience, but a different one. Where you go and you go, est-ce que je peux acheter un croissant, s'il vous plaît? Can I buy a croissant, please? And the guy will go, I speak English. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Like, khalas, uh, you know, we'll do whatever. <laughs> so in those six swing states, Blinken, Biden, they realize that they're behind in the polls in states where the Muslims have the deciding vote. Now I'm aware sometimes that when I say this, because Muslims have been afflicted with this trauma, PTSD, 
because they fail to appreciate the victories the Ummah has made in the past 90 years, such as breaking the hold of colonialism over much of the Muslim world, such as the Algerians who liberated Algeria, the Egyptians who liberated Egypt, kicking out. The colonial powers didn't leave because they felt guilty. They didn't wake up one day. The French didn't wake up one day and say, well, wallahi, they don't say wallahi, but they said that, you know, uh, you know, what we did to the Algerians is so bad, we need to leave. The Algerians kicked them out. The Ummah kicked out the colonizers. America could not get a military base in the region until 1991 when Saddam invaded Kuwait. He made that silly decision to invade. I know everybody likes to say, yeah, but Kuwait were doing this, Kuwait were doing that. In any case, Saddam knew when he invaded, it would give the opportunity for the Americans to come in. In any case, and then you had the Arab Spring, authoritarian regimes toppling. Many people see chaos as something that reflects a disaster for the Ummah. Chaos means that a power is not able to subjugate the other. Chaos means that the repressive powers are unable to fully subjugate those forces that want freedom. The chaos means that the people are banging on the door to freedom and the repressive powers are struggling to shut it, which is why you have all of that chaos. It's a tough and turbulent process, but it's better than the repressive, pro repressive powers when they had full power to repress the other side. I would rather have a balance where freedom can win than one in which the repression is completely suffocated, the freedom movement. In any case, I'm aware that as a result of the self-defeatism and trauma of the Ummah, I'm aware when Sami says it, you might not believe it. So I've brought you, you know, Sahih, like traditions of journalism. I'm going to bring you Axios, the Israeli paper, and I'm going to bring you Politico. I think it's European. But anyway, it's a prestigious thing. So it's not Sami who's saying it. Axios said one week ago, two weeks ago, time's a bit of a blur because... All your domestic flights are more than three hours. You know, I couldn't believe it. I, I, the, on, on this particular trip, I flew Detroit to Arizona, three hours, 56 minutes. Domestic flight, they called it. The nerve, the branding is phenomenal. <laughs> then I flew San Diego to Seattle, two hours and a half, which is London to Tunis. Then I flew Seattle to Houston, Three hours or three hours fifty something again another four hour flight. They call that a domestic flight apparently, which is longer than London to Istanbul. And then you fly here from Dallas. It's three hours and a half on Southwestern. Half the flight is smooth. Half the flight is turbulence. You feel like the plane is going to fall out of the air, and you think, "What on earth possessed me to get on a plane in this place? I want to go home." I didn't actually say I want to go home. I just said shahada la ilaha illallah. The point is that. When you look at those particular swing states, Axios reported and said, if Biden loses, quote, a sliver of the Muslim vote in these states, Biden loses the election. Politico said, if Biden loses 100,000 votes in Michigan, Biden loses the state. That's why Biden, on the 28th of October, came out and said, we don't want that 14 billion to help the displacement of Palestinians. We are against the displacement of Palestinians. Now, I thought that Genocide Joe was lying because I know that he lied about the beheaded babies and then the White House thought it was too great a lie. They had to come out and say Biden didn't mean there was a beheaded babies. He was actually just repeating what Netanyahu told him. And then Biden repeated it later on. And you know, may Allah guide them. You know, may Allah guide them and, and bless us with good health at that age, inshallah. I, mean, I, I didn't say anything. <laughs> Uh, may Allah bless us with good health. May Allah guide them. I mean that sincerely. May Allah bless us with better state of health, inshallah. So Biden goes to Netanyahu, and as a result, they need to remarket and repackage the genocide and ethnic cleansing. Why? Because Blinken identifies a problem. Blinken identifies the problem in that when he's looking at those polls, he believes that those polls are not changing because the Muslim nations have taken any particular position of the genocide. In the beginning, Blinken is confused. Blinken says, and before I say this part, the views expressed once again belong to the speaker alone and do not reflect the organization. They did not ask me what I would say. I did not tell them what I would say. So when they land in Jeddah, please let them through. The beef is between us. Let them do their Umrah. <laughs> let them do their Umrah. Let them do what, a Hajj and the like and whatever. I know you have the concerts now in Jeddah. I, I haven't said anything to them about the concerts. I'm going to talk about the concept of Riyadh, not Jeddah. <laughs> Blinken said that these polls, we're falling in the polls, not because the Muslim states have taken any particular position. Blinken told Netanyahu, I went to Saudi Arabia, I got a fatwa. The chief imam of Mecca gave a fatwa. 
He said, Ya Ibad Allah, make dua for Gaza. I'll cry in your dua if you want as well to add some extra oomph to it. But don't talk about it. Because it's a fitna that might lead you to turn against your rulers. So obey your rulers and obey your scholars. An Imam in Sulaiman Rajhi Mosque in Riyadh came out and said, Ya Ibad Allah, we make dua for Gaza, but let's not talk about issues that we know nothing about. Let's trust that our rulers have more information than we do. So when they do nothing for Gaza, and when they bring Jared Kushner to give a keynote speech in the middle of genocide, he didn't actually say that part, that's me. But in any case, that when our rulers trust that they have the information required and that they're acting accordingly, because your opinions are like those of slugs. And the more you talk about it, the more of a burden you become on your leaders. I have a Turkish friend who was flying out to Medina and he sent me a message. I don't know why he'd send me a message before he goes to Saudi. But in any case, stop. He said, Sammy, uh, I'm going to Medina. And uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that they're going to be talking about Gaza, Sammy. I don't think that they're going that far that they, they're not talking about Gaza. I told him, listen, to Allah, go and make dua, I get to see you again one day, inshallah. He said, Amin, Amin, Abi, Amin. He says, Turkish. So he lands and he sends me the voice note of the khutbah. I actually have it here for anybody interested later on. He hears the word Gaza and he clicks record on his WhatsApp. Good concentration in the khutbah, mashallah. <laughs> The voice note says, from what I heard of it, is, Ya Ibad Allah, we make dua that Allah sends his patience on Gaza. But Ya Ibad Allah, beware the rabble rousers who are using Gaza to turn you against your leaders. Say Alhamdulillah for the stability you have here, and that's because of our leaders. Obey your rulers, obey your scholars, don't talk about issues that you don't know. My wife and I, we run this travel company. My wife likes the idea of reconnecting the memories of the Ummah. So we take people to different places, Bosnia, Barbados, Uzbekistan, Malaysia, Korea, Japan, all these other different places. So she gives talks sometimes at these summits to promote the halal economy and the travel market. Every year she presents in Istanbul at the, World, at the World Halal Summit. So she went this year. She met a Malaysian friend of ours who used to advise the Malaysian government. And he said to her one day over dinner, he said that to in front of the group, they were talking about Saudi and talking about the videos and saying, is Sammy okay? Is he safe? Is he this? Does he go near their embassy? She said, no, he doesn't go anywhere near it. <laughs> <laughs> I need to stop doing that. <laughs> they actually didn't ask that. That wasn't a joke. But in any case, I, get, I don't like it when people ask that question. In any case, he told Sumaya, my wife, he said, tell Sammy that I'm going to Umrah in December and I've received a WhatsApp message that says that we have, we have been asked by the Saudi authorities not to bring kafirs, not to bring free Palestine stickers, and not to record ourselves making dua for Gaza. I told the Sumaya, every time I do a video telling the Ummah what bin Salman is doing, I get a backlash for the first two months, and then apologies for the two months afterwards. I'm not in the mood for a backlash at the moment. Come back from Turkey first, because Erdogan wants to make peace with bin Salman, and also when you're on the train, on the tramway, Please stop talking to me in Arabic. There are racist attacks taking place. Speak in the poshest English that you know. You're half English. They have an inferiority complex to English, but they might do something to you if you speak Arabic. I beg you, speak to me in the poshest English that you have, like the way you see in those period dramas, Downton Abbey and these ones. She said, oh dear husband, okay. <laughs> she actually did. <laughs> May Allah guide the Turks, inshallah. Say, I mean, I mean that sincerely, honestly. So when I was in sunny blue sky, lovely sunshine LA on this beautiful west coast, I was at a dinner and I, we were talking about it and I said, guys, I'm, I heard a rumor that the Saudi authorities are saying no kafirs, no free Gaza stickers, no whatever. I said, that'd be ridiculous if Bin Salman does it. That's mad, you know, but I haven't seen any proof. They were like, wait, 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 wait. Here it is. Habibi, and I'm going in December, here is the message. And I read the WhatsApp message and it says, it's with a heavy heart that we inform you that we've been told, etc." So I did what Sami does. I went and did a podcast about it. And alhamdulillah, I got backlash from Saudis. Apparently now, it's being the rule is being implemented, not on Western Muslims, because they're a bit too loud, but on Eastern Muslims, those who perhaps you know, might listen a bit more. Which is why some of you will be able to go and wear your kafirs, and some of you will find yourselves under pressure. Alhamdulillah, I'd like to take some credit for it, in that at least you rattle the government a bit. And I like to think that if the ummah was louder about these issues, I think they would reverse those policies entirely. But unfortunately, many of the ummah, they believe that Islam is about going to Mecca and Medina, not about standing up for what's right. They believe Islam 
is about living a life where you can pray five times in the masjid and make dua even when the person next door is funding a genocide in Sudan. You want to go make hijra to a country where it has Islamic schools even if the government of that particular country is using your presence in that country to say that we are massacring the ummah elsewhere but these Muslims are saying we have a good Muslim life over here. Let them live their Muslim life while I continue to do what I want to do elsewhere. Let the ummah be ummah that stays in the masajid, that never leaves the masajid, that celebrates the masajid and stays in it and makes the masajid solely for ibadah. Let this ummah be an ummah where they read in the seerah that the masajid were the center of community in everything whether it's to do with the fate of the state. Let the ummah read that Khalid ibn al-Walid was demoted by Umar ibn al-Khattab in the masjid. Let the ummah read that the Sahaba used to discuss the next plans in the masjid. Let the ummah read about that, celebrate it, but never ever do it in the masjid. Let them make it so that where Sahaba made the masjid the center for everything, let, the, or let this ummah be that the masjid is mainly for ibadah and not to talk about anything else. And I respect American law. I know American law is very similar to that. So I'm not saying them that they should make it a center. I'm just saying that the ummah has become an ummah sometimes where perhaps it values the rituals over the very substance of Islam, which is that they stand up for justice. Because for those Americans listening, there's actually an interesting point. The companions of the Prophet Sallallahu only a minority of them are buried in Medina. The majority are buried outside of Medina because their interpretation of Islam was to go out and stand for justice, was to go out and spread the deen, was to go out and take action, while the ummah of today wants to go back in. They want to say, Mashallah, Sahaba went out, but Akhi and I want to go back in. So it's a very strange, my ummah of today, sometimes they read the seerah, but do the opposite of what they read. They read a hadith and celebrate it, but do the opposite. But it is what it is. And maybe if you have some branding tips for me, you can help me out, inshallah, to convince them otherwise. I mean, you made the, the handball football and that stuff, so you can help me out with it, inshallah. In any case, Blinken told Netanyahu that we have the Muslim nations. I got a fatwa from Abdurrahman al sudis And all of the durus in Saudi are obey your ruler, obey they don't talk about Gaza, because it's a fitna. UAE gave us a statement that blamed the Palestinians for what happened. Abdullah bin Zayed tweeted, I spoke to my good friend Blinken. Two hours later, UAE issued a statement that we are blaming the Palestinians. And then they panicked a bit when there was a backlash. So they were the first to send aid to Gaza. And now when they got frustrated with Netanyahu, they were also the first to send in CNN to see what's happening in Gaza because Bin Zayed said, look, listen, I'm getting a lot of backlash from my ummah. I, mean, I don't know if he considers it his ummah, but in any case, I'm getting a lot of backlash from these Muslims. I'm getting a lot of backlash from the Western Muslims. People are very loud about my role. I want Netanyahu to go. I want to put him under pressure. I'm going to bring CNN in in the hope that they might force Netanyahu to be toppled so that another Israeli leader can come to power so that the Muslims can get off my back and I can continue normalization without the pressure of them telling me that I have to do something. So Blinken, when he goes to Netanyahu, Netanyahu says, what's the problem? I don't understand. The Muslim nations, Netanyahu gives a speech. He says, we thank our friends for understanding our position. His friends weren't American. He was talking about the Muslim leaders. He actually was. <laughs> he said, Barakallah. He didn't say Barakallah. But in any case. <laughs> so when Blinken goes and says to him, Blinken identifies and says, the issue is not the Muslim leaders. The issue is 1.9 billion Muslims won't stop talking about Gaza. 1.9 billion Muslims won't stop talking about Palestine. Which means the algorithm which used to promote certain raunchy figures and Love Island and Kanye West and his troubles with former wives and stuff like that. Instead now, the algorithms are all promoting Palestinian content. Blinken said before Palestine was an issue limited to the Muslims. But now Sarah, Dave, Michael, Smith, Jeremy, Joe, any more names? And, 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 and Bob, Peter. You know, it's funny, that Bob thing. I met uh, Imam Tom uh, Fakini. So while I'm talking to him, he just said, to, I mentioned his name a couple of times, and he went, yeah, Tom, Tom. I was like, what's wrong with it? He goes, you just here, they call me Tom. I said, well, let me tell you as an English person, it's Tom. He goes, whatever makes you happy, bro. <laughs> in any case, Blinken said that as a result of the Ummah being so loud, the Ummah refusing to talk about it, the algorithm is now favoring Palestinian content and that's changing people's minds because we're falling in the polls over an issue where American troops aren't even on the ground. We're falling in the polls because they genuinely don't like our policy. So Bibi, Bibi is Netanyahu's nickname. May Allah never give us any similar nicknames. Can you imagine if, they, if you had nicknames? Oh, oh, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, please, no nicknames like that, Ya Rabbi. 
Ya Rab, don't let me make a verbal mistake while I'm speaking where someone grabs onto it and attaches to me a label that I don't like. Ya Rab, Gul Ameen. Gul Ameen. Those who don't say Ameen, may Allah give you a nickname like that. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. <laughs> I take it back, I take it back. <laughs> In any case, Netanyahu says to, Blinken says to Netanyahu, according to Axios, according to Axios, the elevated source, that we need a new marketing strategy for genocide and ethnic cleansing. He said, what's the marketing strategy? He said, instead of saying we're committing genocide against these animals, why don't we send them a letter, a very nice, cute letter, where we tell them, listen, we're coming to bomb your home and take your land, and you want to build a nice Red Sea resort on it, or Mediterranean resort on it, my geography. I'm in America, it gets muffled sometimes. We want to build a nice resort on it, but we want to give you an opportunity four hours a day to leave your house and to, get, and to leave. Now, if you don't leave, we'll kill you. But we thought we're just going to be nice and give you four hours if you want to leave. And we'll let you leave through a humanitarian corridor under the protection of the Israeli army. The problem is Axios reports that Netanyahu responded and said, hang on, hang on, hang on. Why have you gone from not calling for a ceasefire or a pause to now calling for a humanitarian pause? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Inna fi qalbi inna. In my heart there is something strange. I'm, I smell a plot over here. Is this Biden trying to lure me into a ceasefire like in May 2021? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that you think the hearts are united but qulubuhum shatta. Their hearts are divided. That's why when the humanitarian pause was implemented, Biden, when he came off the plane, he was asked, he said, it's, it came late, but at least it came, expressing the frustration with Netanyahu. But the point of this particular part of the story, Ibad Allah, is what made, what made Blinken shift from wholehearted support to a genocide, to arguing for a humanitarian pause, to pushing for a hostage truce, to pushing for a sustainable ceasefire, and now talking about a low intensity, and now offering a two-month truce to Hamas. Was it Saudi Arabia? No. Was it UAE? No. Was it Turkey's Erdogan? Where trade between Turkey and Israel has increased apparently 30% since the start of the genocide. Because Erdogan believes he has an economic crisis because for 20 years interest rates went up and he was putting the interest rates up and then one day he woke up, I think maybe because he's worried about his later age getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he woke up one day and said that it was halal in the 20 years and now it's haram, I need to bring it back down. And he crushed the currency as a result. When he crushed the currency, Erdogan said, I need I have an economic crisis. You know, there are still the Turks there. You know, it was a very tough election, very difficult election. And I need to work, take care of my economy. I've reconciled with UAE. I told them, please, Ta'ala, let's reconcile. Please, please. And the UAE said, khalas, 50 billion. And let's reconcile together. And they said, hadar, 50 billion. Barakallahu feek. And we will not talk about UAE at all. They went to Saudi Crown Prince. They told him, yes, Samuel Emir, please. Like, we're sorry about Khashoggi. Like, we'll throw the case out. We'll throw it out of the courts. And we'll invite you to, to, to Ankara as well. And bin Salman took advantage. If you notice, when he landed in Ankara to meet uh, Erdogan, the, the, they have this tradition when a leader comes where the, general, where the soldiers, they stand, and the leader is supposed to say, Meraba Askar, you know, welcome soldier. And they go, huh! Bin Salman, the wily fox. He walks in, instead of saying, Meraba Askar, he says, Assalamu alaikum. And the soldiers go, uh, uh. Uh, because he wanted an image to show that Erdogan claims to be a Sultan, but they don't even know how to respond to Walaikum as -salam. They don't have to respond to Salam Alaikum. Very cheeky play for somebody who's just introduced alcohol to Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah, yeah, really, like, mashallah, you know, it's... Uh... In any case, the, pay, the people who've brought this change from no ceasefire to humanitarian pause to hostage truce to sustainable ceasefire to low intensity warfare to this offer of truce from the Israelis to Hamas, what brought it about was public opinion. And this is where I enter the tail end of the talk because I won't go on for too long because people have complained sometimes that there's never a Q&A because I go on for too long. So I promise this time I'll show due respect that for, and leave it for, if you have questions. They say that when there are questions, it means you didn't do a good job in addressing the points. In any case, it's an indictment whenever there are so many questions. In any case, the point is that when you look at the situation as it's unfolding today, it's true that we're seeing a genocide unfolding. It's true we're seeing an ethnic cleansing unfolding. But ya ibadallah, when you look at the ICJ ruling, do you think that Israel wanted to see an ICJ ruling like that? No. Do you think that Biden is happy that he's falling in the polls over the Palestine-Israel issue? Do you think that Israel is happy that it spent billions on a PR that the Ummah broke for free? Do you think Israel is happy 
that it's seeing. You know where the, that, that spokesman, the one who threatened the ITV, I don't know if you've seen it. The ITV presenter says in the UK, ITV is a sophisticated channel in the United Kingdom. It's not like your channels here in America where, you know, I can't lie to you. I sit in the hotel room sometimes and I think, let me just watch American channels. Oh my God, you will not believe what happened today. And it's something about Walmart or something, whatever. You know, he gets you excited and then gives you a deflated news, you know? Gets you geared up. Oh my God, something. Fox News. Oh, and just breaking in. It's, it's hot weather today. And you know, I, I remember, I remember in, in 2018 when I came to New York, I was in JFK Airport. And I went to pick up a car to rent a car to drive to Washington. Because I heard road trips are really good. And also, I didn't really want to fly. I don't like flying. So I, I told my friends, let's go on a road trip because it's beautiful. That ride is not really as beautiful as everyone thinks it is. This part is beautiful, like West Coast. It's lovely. Especially, was it the P PH1, P1, P? PCH. I said PH like it's a science thing. <laughs> you know, P yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't do science in America. Uh, Allah, you know, Allah, may, may, you know, you guys conquer the world, the Liberic, you know, your, your branding is everywhere. You know, your Oreos taste like they're a death wish. They don't taste like our Oreos. Your Fanta is just too orange for me to drink. You know, like I think in the, in the UK, we have more stringent laws. The point is, when I was in New York, to give an example of the headlines, when I picked up the car and I'm walking through, I dropped my bags and I rushed to the TV and the guards went like that. And they said, excuse me, what are you doing? And I panicked because I realized, wait, I'm in America, you can't just drop your bags like that. And I was like, KFC is run out of chicken. They said, what? I said, look, the headline is there. You know, it was CNN, KFC runs out of chicken. And I thought, only in America. <laughs> <laughs> only in America. American dream. In any case, when you look at the fact that Biden is now concerned, and you look at Levy, with the, the ITV channel, there's a presenter, he talks to the spokesman of Israel, and he says that but it didn't all begin on October 7th, did it? And the Israeli spokesman says, I warn you against contextualizing October 7th, a really nasty threat. Basically saying, I will make you lose your job if you try to make this a serious discussion and debate about what actually happened on October 7th. The reason he threatened him so publicly and not in a sophisticated way is because all of their sophistication has been broken by you. All of their ability to have this sophisticated control over the narrative has been broken by you. When I went back to the Yaqeen podcast, because someone made a joke, these Americans, they said he finished his Yaqeen podcast and picked up this very English teacup and he drank his tea. I was like, what teacup are they talking about? So I thought, let me go back and see the video, what teacup they're talking about, so I can buy another one. In any case, before the Yaqeen podcast came up, IDF advert. So I thought, I need to do Tahara. I need to... <laughs> So I'm going to listen to Saud al-Sharim, Surah Taha, which is the surah, his melody, in, in, in his, his recitation when I was 16 years of age is what really got me into the Qur'an when I listened to it. Before I was just praying, you know, like, if dad wasn't watching, you just do turbo. <laughs> After that surah, I took my, my prayers very seriously, especially because, you know, when you memorize a big surah as a teenager, there's a bit of prestige to it. Because all your friends are just reading, Qul a'udhu rabbin nas, malikin nas. And then you come out and you go, Qala fama rabbukuma ya Musa, qala rabbuna alladhi. And genuinely you feel, you start going, and they're like, Sammy, you know, you take way too long in prayers now. I'm like, it's Surah Taha. It's a long surah. <laughs> I was a teenager. Don't judge me on it. But teenagers, honestly, it gives you a bit of prestige amongst your friends. I would encourage it. Anyway, and Shuraim is very easy to memorize his naghma, his, his, his melody and the like. Although in recent times, I've taken a great love for Sudanese uh, maqamat when they read. You know, like a Noreen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm Al-Deen, Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een, Ihdina Al-Sirat Al-Mustaqeem, Sirat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim, Ghayr Al-Maghdubi Alayhim, Waladhaa. And he holds his breath for the whole way. Aleen. And you go, Ameen. Beautiful Sudanese Naghma. When I opened Saud al to make Tahara from seeing the IDF advert, it's like the IDF wanted to do the Bismillah for me. Because it popped up before Saud al For those of you who know social media advertising, for those of you who know social media advertising, you'll know that in order to get an advert, on things that are unrelated to the issue, you need to spend a hell of a lot of money. You need to spend a lot of money. Like I remember when I first started Facebook adverts many years when I was trying to start the international interest to make it spread. And I'd be like, I want it to be popular in America, UK, English speaking countries, Malaysia, this place. And I would just watch the reach go like bigger and bigger and bigger. But 
the price go higher, 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 higher. I said, I can't afford this. And then eventually you can only really afford to spread the message within your area of London. So for them to spend that much money shows that they spent billions in order to restore control over the narrative. Even the channels that brought the Palestinians, they were stunned because this generation of Palestinians are eloquent in English. They're able to present their case and they were able to push back on that, do you condemn Hamas, do you condemn Hamas, do you condemn Hamas? Until now it's become absolutely irrelevant because everybody now is focused on the genocide. The Israelis are realizing that the ones who are moving the goalposts of the narrative are no longer the Israelis. The ones who are controlling the narrative are no longer the Israelis. The ones who are controlling the narrative are one 1.9 billion Muslims amplifying the voice of the Palestinians, responding to the call to the Palestinians. They are tweeting, they are sharing, they are doing their TikTok, they are breaking the algorithm. They are absolutely, it's so stupendously popular that the alt is penetrating all the bubbles of the algorithm that it makes a girl in LA. Remember when I started, I said the West Coast, and I mean this sincerely with the greatest of respect to you, if the earth was flat, this would be where the end of the earth is. Because all the world lives next to each other on the other side of the world. Like I said, England. In France, Germany, you guys have to fly at least six hours before you even get to the Atlantic. In any case, the point being is that a girl in LA says she grew up in a Zionist environment, never having seen Palestinian voices, but as a result of TikTok, say Ameen, because if you don't say Ameen, it's as if you prefer the narrative be controlled by BBC and CNN. Allahumma never let them control the narrative. Ya Rabbil Alameen. A Zionist girl on TikTok says, as a result of TikTok, as a result of TikTok, I finally heard Palestinian voices. And she says, I can't unsee what I've seen and I'm dedicating my channel now to Palestinian content to talk about Palestine. Another girl says, you know what? I want to understand because I've been seeing videos of Palestinians that have been amplified by the Ummah of 1.9 billion that broke the algorithm and broke the bubbles of the TikTok algorithms, which means that the Palestinian content reached every single handheld phone in the world. She says, I want to understand. I've been watching these videos of Palestinians. They're being bombed and killed, but they keep saying, Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. They keep saying, inna lillahi wa inna lillahi raji'oon. They keep saying everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we will continue to struggle and we will continue to resist. I want to know where they get their resilience from. And they keep quoting these passages from the Quran. So I'm going to oh, use my TikTok and we're going to go through pages of the Quran together. You, my audience, every day we're going to do so. One week later, she says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. And I saw her with Haifa Yunus at one of the conventions. People looking and looking at Gaza and while our hearts weep and our hearts are breaking and while some of us in the, the audacity of some of us to call the Palestinians weak when the world is so taken by their strength, so taken by their resilience that the number of people entering Islam just over the past three months is phenomenal because they don't see weakness in the Palestinians. They see absolute strength and resilience and they say, I want to be like those Palestinians. I want to learn the resilience of these Palestinians and they are the conclusion that they are coming to, subhanAllah, the conclusion they are coming to. Why do they open the Quran? Because they, the conclusion they come to is this resilience is not a genetic thing. This resilience is a Quranic Islamic thing. And that's why they enter Islam because they are searching for the resilience that the Palestinians have, that they have concluded can only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a blessed people. May Allah accept the shuhada. That's why, Ya Ibad Allah, beware when you say the Ummah is weak. Beware when you say the Ummah is in a state of weakness. You might be weak. And therefore, you're projecting it on the Ummah. But the Ummah has actually never been weak. Ibad Allah, I used to believe the Ummah was weak. I used to believe the Ummah was weak. I used to sit in London in my very comfortable home, alhamdulillah, because my father, mashallah, was an activist and he established a media company later. And he raised me and he taught me everything I know about politics. He used to merge politics and deen. He made it very seamless for me. Whenever any problem would happen, he'd tell me something about hadith or about the seerah. So by the time I became 20, 21 years of age, it was just natural to attach the seerah to everyday problems. I know some people have said that that seems to be a very like unique thing or the like. It's not a unique thing in my house. If you're impressed with what I have to say, you have not met Muhammad al-Hashim al-Hamdi, my father who is my teacher who raised me and taught me how to do it. In any case, when you look at the way that they're turning towards the deen and Islam, the ummah has never actually been weak. So when I thought the ummah was weak, 
I went to Bosnia. I read Ali Izzet Begevich's book, Inescapable Questions. And I was fascinated to discover Muslims in the heart of Europe who'd been Muslim for 700, 800 years. And I, they were ethnically Europeans. And they were still holding on to Islam. So a Bosnian friend of mine said, I'd love to show you Bosnia. Let's make it a lad's trip. I said, lad's trip? Cool. We rent a car and we just go. We go. In, in Europe, what you can do is, unlike here in America, where you can only, you're in the same country and you have to drive 50 hours just to get from one coast to the other, 50 hours in Europe will take you from London all the way to Riyadh and, 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 and Jeddah or that kind. So when you go to Bosnia, you can go Bosnia, Montenegro, Albania, Kosovo, Macedonia, all in the space of 10 days. Value for money. In any case. When I landed in Bosnia and I got to discover the Bosnians, I finally got to hear their story. Based on what I read on Ali Hazid Begovic, I was able to engage in some conversations, some facts, and I got to ask them about it. And I discovered that the Bosnians, Bismillah, Mashallah, Qutala Billah, they have a masjid in Sarajevo called the Ghazi Huzr Bay Masjid. Now, sometimes when we take our groups, we take them to the Ghazi Huzr Bay Masjid, and then they go in two minutes and they come out. And I realized why they go in two minutes and they come out. It's because they don't know the story of Ghazi Huzr Bay. Ghazi Huzr Bay stands in 1532 in the middle of Sarajevo and he says, Allahumma, I have no kids. But I'm going to leave behind this waqf, this masjid, this madrasa, and this library. Allah, please accept it for me for Yawm Al-Qiyamah because I don't have kids to make dua for me afterwards. The Ottomans are kicked out of Bosnia in the 1600s, maybe early 1700s. If I get my dates wrong, Allah Karib, you can go and research it. The point is that after the Ottomans are kicked out, Islam continues in the heart of Bosnia. They don't give it up, proving that it was not spread by the sword. The Austro-Hungarians shut down a few mosques, but they don't shut down the Ghazi Huzr Bay Mosque. Then the Yugoslavian Kingdom eventually emerges, and they do a census where they identify that the Muslims are identifying as Muslims first, not their ethnicity. So they say this is quite problematic for our Yugoslav identity. So to prevent these Muslims from organizing, we're going to divide their areas into nine banvinas, nine provinces, and we're going to make sure that Muslims are the minority in each of these provinces so that they're unable to organize together. In 1938, under the communist regime, one of the philosophers is asked to address the Muslim question. The answer to the Muslim question is to shut down Muslim associations, execute half of the student leaders, put the rest in hard labor, ban the Quran, ban the manifestation of the deen, ban the hijab, and essentially repress the Muslim minority in Bosnia. The Bosnians don't give up. The Bosnians keep teaching the Quran. All the Bosnians have to do to get comfort is give up La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah and go to their ballet dances and go do whatever the Yugoslav communist regime want them to do. If they give up La ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah, they won't be persecuted. The Bosnians refuse to do so. In 1980s, Yugoslavia collapses. Bosnia is formed in 1988-1989 as Yugoslavia collapses. The Muslims form their own state and Ali Izzet Begovic says because his tolerance comes from Islam, not from white supremacist Europe, which used to massacre the Jews or the like, we are going to establish a nation where all religions live together and the Muslims will be the majority. The Serbs invade and they commit a genocide and they commit an ethnic cleansing. 1995, the Muslims are still in Bosnia and even today, Islam is still preserved there. The Ghazi Huzr Bay Mosque remains standing since 1532. The Ummah has never been weak. You look at Turkey, Ataturk comes to power, imposes secularism and tells the military to do a coup on everybody who threatens to re-Islamize the Turkish state. They ban the printing of the Qur'an, they execute scholars, they imprison the others, they turf the others, they massacre the Kurds who come to revolt because they want to re-establish Islam. And as a result, Adnan Menderes eventually comes to power in the 1960s, restores the Adhan, they do a military coup. 1980, they do a military coup again. 1997, Erbakan comes to power, they do a coup again. Why? Because despite the ban on hijab, despite the ban on Qur'an, despite the ban on hadith, despite the ban on women having education if they wear hijab, the Muslims refuse to give up La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah even though if they give it up they will live a life of comfort they say we would rather struggle than give up La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah 1997 Erbakan comes to power there's a coup and then 2003 they break the system completely they deliver Erdogan to power Turkey is unrecognizable from the days of Ataturk because now it's haven for the Muslims the Ummah has never actually been weak rather it is the Ummah has been unappreciative of the fact that Allah decides the outcome as he wishes how he wishes and when he wishes and therefore the Ummah is dissatisfied with the way that Allah conducts his own affairs and therefore they believe if it's not an outcome that they want, there must be something horribly wrong with it. That's why, Ya Ibad Allah, when you look at the impact that you've had on Gaza and Palestine, let's be brutally honest here. The ones who forced Biden to buckle is you. The one who made Macron call for a ceasefire is you. 
The one who made the Deputy Prime Minister of Belgium call for sanctions against Israel is you. The one that made it possible for the ICJ to hear the case is you. The one who made it impossible for Biden to rescue Israel from the ICJ is you. The one who made the CNN presenter apologize for giving 24-hour coverage to unsubstantiated allegations of beheaded babies was you. I asked the elders, have you ever seen a media presenter apologize for their coverage of Gaza Palestine? Never. In the space of three months, we saw BBC, CNN, and these others apologize for their coverage. Do you think they apologized because Biden asked them? Do you think they apologized because Netanyahu said, guys, I know I'm committing a genocide, but be fair in your media coverage. They apologized because they received such backlash on social media that they got concerned by how many people were told by Gaza and Palestine, and therefore they decided that they needed to apologize in order to rescue themselves. Moving forward now, Ya Ibadallah. I said this is where I wrap up 25 minutes ago. Somebody made a joke that when Sammy says it, he's going to talk for another 50 minutes. I promise five minutes and I'm done. Moving forward, Ya Ibadullah. Biden was asked, are you concerned that you're going to lose the Muslim vote? He said, why should I worry? The other side is Trump. He wants to put a Muslim ban. Because Biden believes that the comfort of the West Coast is so valuable and so comfortable. And I've seen your houses. Bismillah, mashallah, qutayblah. May Allah increase you and increase you in, in, in the resources that you have. I confess that when I went home to London and I entered the house and my family greeted me, Sumaya said to me, what's wrong? Like, like, you, you look like, I told her, no, I'm happy to be home. She goes, then what's wrong? I told her, I feel claustrophobic. <laughs> <laughs> Everything feels so tight in London. You know, <laughs> Biden believes that the comforts that you enjoy are such that you will not sacrifice them at all to punish him for a genocide. Biden believes that for you to see Trump on TV says horrible things is something, is a, is, is a scenario that is so horrible for you that you will forgive Biden for the genocide. The reason why I put it that way is not to mock you in any way whatsoever. It's mainly to gaslight you and emotionally blackmail you. Stuff. I know, it's not that. It's partly that, but it's not that. You, know? so you can cut that out later. In any case, <laughs> the point that I'm saying is this. Let's suppose the worst case scenario happens. No, the worst case scenario is genocide, Joe gets a second term. But in any case, let's suppose the second worst case scenario happens, which is Trump comes to power. Ibadullah, let's do a comparison here. Is Trump going to send somebody to seize your home and give it to a white supremacist? Is Trump going to deploy the army to commit a genocide against you? Is Trump going to oppose the Muslim ban and make it so you can't see Sammy for four years, likely. But don't miss me too much. I promise I'll come after four years. And I won't be too upset about it either, even though I might miss America. But I've seen nearly all of it now. I've been through, I think I've been to nearly every single state. I'm probably more American than most of you here, to be honest. Like, you know, mashallah. Like, I've, I've driven across, mashallah. And you know, I've been to Mississippi and Tennessee and, and New York. And you know, I've been to California and, I've been, I've been, and Seattle. You know, Seattle was a very interesting experience, I have to say. No, yeah, yeah. I didn't realize it was the woke capital of America. My goodness, they made it very clear. Yeah, yeah, they made it very clear, mashallah. Yeah, yeah, but it's a very beautiful city, but in my opinion, one of the most beautiful cities in America I've been to. Like, mashallah, even though it was raining, but I'm, I don't mind the rain because I'm from London. Like I said, five days of summer. I thought it was beautiful, Seattle. I think everybody should visit it. I don't know about living there, but visit it, yeah. The point is that when you look at the worst thing that Trump will do, it reminds me a lot of, I have my brother Yusuf, he's a businessman in Tokyo. And mashallah, successful one. Speaks Japanese fluent. Very strange experience when you go to Tokyo and he's next to you. People like to you. I told him, Yusuf, I want to have halal ramen. I want to have Japanese food. I don't want like, this fob off, you know. He said, okay, we'll go to a Japanese restaurant and we'll get ramen and we'll go get halal ramen. So he's ordering for me, you know. Nandeo, oh, so this guy, I don't know. Arigato. Do you want ketchup with that? Yeah, I like a ketchup. I like to him, Yusuf, that wasn't Japanese. Like, that wasn't. It's a very So anyway, Yusuf, one day we were sitting talking to each other. And I said to him, yeah, Yusuf, you know, it's not all about money. Like, there's more to life than money. He told me, Sammy, wallahi, you're right. I promise, I accept that you're right. But I would rather cry in a Mercedes than your Toyota Yaris. <laughs> and I feel like when the, with this Trump conundrum, it's very similar to that. Because the reality is this, Ya Ibadullah. The fact that the Democrats believe that genocide, that genocide is not important enough to you to make you do something to punish genocide, Joe, shows you how little they regard you. The fact that he's still more worried about the Zionist bloc vote than losing the Muslim vote, 
The fact that the Democrats are saying that the Muslims will forget by November shows you how much they hold you in disdain. Now, right now, I assume sometimes Congress people, they come to see you, right? Now, here's how I imagine they do it usually. The Congress people don't actually research Islam before they come. Because in history, only two minorities have, every de have ever demonstrated an ability to punish candidates. One is the Zionists, and the other is the Black Caucuses. Muslims have never really punished anyone. Muslims have delivered candidates, like they delivered Bush in Florida, but they've never really punished candidates, which is why when you tend to vote for someone, they tend to betray you very soon afterwards. That's the difference. This is the first time in American history where the Muslims have a chance to show their ability to punish a candidate. This is the first time that the Muslims have the ability to punish a sitting U.S. president. Now, right now, when the congressperson comes to you, because you never punished anyone, they don't do the research beforehand. They do the research in the car. They're driving towards the masjid, and they will say to their assistant, I want to wow these Muslim audiences. What can I say to wow them? And the, and the secretary will go, things Muslims do. Uh, they, got a, they got a greeting. It's uh, assalamu as, as alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. All right. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. And everybody goes, <laughs> mashallah. It's actually assalamu alaikum. But you know, assalamu alaikum is fine. Or if he comes to you in Eid, he'll be like, Mubarak Eid. And you'll be like, it's Eid Mubarak, but thank you so much for coming. Thank you for giving us the time of day. Thank you so much for coming. I'm not saying that's what you guys do here. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I've seen Masajid do it. Other Masajid. That's when you guys don't have the ability to punish. Now I reckon, I reckon, I reckon, and, and, and hear me out on this. I reckon that if Muslims punish a sitting US president, and the views expressed are the speaker's own. I'm going back to London. I hope you let me through the border again, but I promise it's just my opinion. They, and, and it has nothing to do with the organization. They are innocent. I'm the... I reckon that if Muslims punished a sitting U.S. president, I reckon that when I see a live stream of you guys praying Taraweeh prayers next year, I'll find the congressperson praying in the back. I reckon that the next time the congressperson comes to this masjid, he will have done his research in such a way that he will stand before you like this and he will say, and everybody, we got a tough, you know, ride ahead and, you know, we got to stay together for our causes and our principles because as the Prophet Muhammad said, in amal bi niyari. And for those, and, and, and genuinely, and another one might come and say, guys, the road ahead is tough. It's tough, the road ahead. But as the Prophet Muhammad would say, in amal usri yusra. <laughs> Very much possible. Didn't Biden say, inshallah, and everybody went wild? Didn't Biden say, inshallah, and everybody went wild? Where do you think he learned inshallah from? Because they told him Muslims like these references. But you're not important enough for him to learn beyond inshallah. But if you punish a sitting US president, if you show the ability to punish, the Congress person will fear that you have the ability to punish and therefore he needs to take you seriously. But if a sitting US president commits a genocide and wins a second term, because the Muslims say that, yeah, they committed a genocide. But, and I know these imams are going to emerge very soon. Not the imams here, I, 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 I don't know what they think. They didn't tell me, and these are my views and nobody else's. But you'll get some wise guys who come later on before September. They'll say, yeah, Ibadullah, be calm and think carefully. Yes, there was a genocide. But we're making an application for parking for the masjid. <laughs> Ya Ibadallah, think carefully. Yes, they committed a genocide. But I won't be invited to the White House iftar. <laughs> ya Ibadallah, yes, they committed a genocide. But, uh, you'll be like, but what? But, uh, but you know, but you know what? Let's think calmly, not emotionally. Why are Muslims so emotional? A woman in Atlanta, to be a bit serious, she stood up after I gave a talk in Atlanta, after I'd finished. And she said to me, Sammy, you know, you're here at the wrong time. I thought, what do you mean you're here at the wrong time? She said to me, all of these people here will forget by September. They need somebody to remind them because when the fever of the genocide leaves, 
people will start to look and say, do I really want to suffer four years of Trump? But yeah, ibadullah, there is a wonderful tweet that I saw by an American Sudanese activist called Hind Mekki, where she said, so Kamala Harris gave a video where she said, we're launching the first campaign to counter Islamophobia. Allah, Allah. <laughs> do you think that she's doing it because she actually feels for you? She's doing it because the Democrats got together and they said that these Muzis are angry. Like they're really, no, I'm calling Muzis because they won't give you the respect to call you Muslims. <laughs> I'm actually being serious. I don't know what's wrong with you people. <laughs> they're saying, let's throw them a bone that they can chew on. And then they sent an email out. Trump wants to put the Muslim ban, but we stand against it. So I struggled for a bit. I was racking my brains. How do I address this? How do I address this? How do I address this? Not because I have any involvement. I'm a UK citizen. I'll be leaving, inshallah, for, for, for whatever. And, and I'd like to visit America again, if, you know, inshallah. I know I didn't plead in the embassy, but I've grown to love America. So, you know, I'd like the opportunity to come back and try the food scene in Houston and the food trucks. You know, New York skyline is nice. When you go in, it's not so great, but the skyline is lovely, inshallah. And I'd love to come to sunny California in the winter, inshallah, with the lovely sunshine and the Pacific Ocean and the beach and the halal areas are really nice. The point is that she put the tweet out after they sent an email saying Trump wants to put a Muslim ban. And she said, I want to inform the Democrats that we Muslims survived four years of Trump. 20,000 Palestinians did not survive four years of Biden. Ibadullah, let me put it to you quite bluntly. You have two bad choices in November, unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervenes and does something, because Allah is always in charge of affairs. I'm only analyzing based on what's in front of me, but I'm aware Allah can change the situation as He wishes. But supposing that your choices in November are between Trump and Biden, you are, regardless of who wins, you're in for a tough four years. But the only choice that you really have in November is this. You can live four years with dignity in that you punished a sitting U.S. president and you showed the world that if they commit a genocide, there's no way they can win a second term because all Muslims are ready to struggle and ready to be in discomfort for the sake of their brethren and their ummah on the other side of the world, that they will never give up Palestine, they will never give up Gaza, they will never give up their brothers and sisters, and they will get their justice. If the Muslim leaders won't do it, the Muslims of America will do it, and they will do it, and a rabbi raza will come from London and plead with them and beg them to do it as well. You can choose to live those four years with the dignity, with the dignity that you punished a sitting US president and you don't care about the consequences. Or you can live those four years in humiliation where Biden wins the second term because you chose not to punish him and he spends four years not giving you the time of day because he'll laugh in the White House and he'll say, can you believe that we killed 20,000 of their brethren and they still voted blue? They still voted for me. And one guy would be like, I'm telling you, these Muslims have no dignity. They have no self-respect. And somebody would say, don't you think we should at least visit them? Why visit them? Why go to them and say, they'll come knocking on our door. They came to us after we committed a genocide. And even when you go visit them on the door, they'll be like, come back tomorrow. And then the Zionists will walk in, they'll be like, please, please, come in. You are relevant. These guys have no self-respect. These are relevant. This is what I meant by gaslighting and emotionally blackmailing. Now, I'm not gaslighting you. I'm not emotionally blackmailing you, even though you may feel it is that way. And if you feel it's that way, maybe inshallah, you'll think about why you feel that way, even though I'm not doing it in the way perhaps that I am doing it. <laughs> but what I'm saying, Ya Ibadallah, is this. The data shows that Muslims have the potential to have the deciding vote. And I, as somebody from London, am envious of you. Because all the polls in London show in the UK show that the opposition party, which also supported the genocide, is set to win a landslide election. Now it may not be the case, because only Allah knows the ghaib. I thought the Brexit vote would be very tight. Uh, sorry, I thought the Brexit vote would be a landslide in favor of staying in the EU. And I was so convinced of it, I didn't even go to vote. And then I woke up one day, I woke up the next day, and I said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Open borders is going to be finished soon. Because a bunch of racists, they put some billboards showing Hitler-esque imagery. I should have gone and voted. So I'm telling you as a person who made the mistake. Ya ibadullah. I don't have the ability to make the difference in the UK. But wallahi, you have the ability to make the difference. Wallahi, you have the ability to do something. You have the ability to make us proud. You have the ability to deliver justice. You have the ability to show the world that no one can commit a genocide and win a second term. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is as if he could have chosen any state in America to be the deciding state. It just so happens that the swing states that will make the difference happen to be the states where the Muslims have the deciding vote. Biden knows this so much that he's been looking for a mosque in, in Masjid in Michigan, Michigan in order to try to find a mosque that will receive him. But who's seen Godfather here? The film Godfather. Right, you know that scene towards the end where Marlon Brando, Don Corleone, tells his son Michael when they're fighting with the Barzinis and he says the, the friend, the friend who brings the message from the other side, he says that's the, that's the traitor. The message that, I'm not saying it. <laughs> I'm just saying just food for thought, popular references, cultural references, you know, just to show I'm a bit hip as well, you know. To be honest, like the reason why I know a lot of these new, like, you know, Iggy Azalea, Nicki Minaj, you know, Nicki Minaj, Nicki Minaj. The reason why I know all of them, to be honest, is not because I knew them growing up. It's because Bin Salman introduced me to them. <laughs> no, really, really. I did not. Imagine the horror when my father said, Sami, Bin Salman has invited this uh, Izzy Agalia. Is, is he Galia? Is he Galia? I told him, who's that? So we Googled it and we actually typed in Izzy Agalia instead of Iggy Azalea. Ikhwani, don't search it. <laughs> and don't search it with your father either. <laughs> don't do it! <laughs> don't. The idea that the land of the two holy mosques introduced me to that Saraha is the most horrifying thing I think I can, I can think of. And when I thought maybe that maybe because her first performance, the trousers ripped so she had to be taken off stage. So I thought maybe, you know, there would be some like, oh, did someone just Google it? Uh, sister, don't Google it. <laughs> I thought you Googled it, yeah. <laughs> La hawla, put your phones away. Taqullah, jama'a. The point is that I thought that after the first performance when her trousers ripped, that maybe they will do, you know, because she, you know, she did her performance, bow down to the goddess, you know, bring your prophets and bow. But then she tweeted afterwards and said, you know, that they invited me again to perform. And, you know, and even uh, for those who want to understand why I'm so upset about Saudi, on the night that Israel began its ground invasion, they cut off the internet on Gaza and they began its ground invasion. It was a Saturday. On that Saturday night, Shakira was in Riyadh dancing. Now, there's a joke I've been making also based on Masjid, so I won't make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's about to do with the lyrics of a song. In any case, which I didn't know until Bin Salman introduced me. Yeah. <laughs> you know. The point is, Ya Ibadallah, to end on this point, even though now it's been 40 minutes since I said that. <laughs> but I promise, this, this is where. Because notice I didn't say, I promise I'll finish on this point. I said, I will. Because somebody, a sheikh, told me, yes, Sami, if you're going to keep saying it with sincerity, just don't say, I promise, so you don't have to kafala afterwards. And I said, yalla khalas. So this time, I promise I'll finish on this point. Ibadallah, what you choose to do with your vote is your choice. The reality is that we saw a genocide live streamed. We saw an ethnic cleansing live streamed. And now the choice before you is whether you want to go down in history, because historians will write, whether you want to go down in history as the people who toppled genocide Joe and punished the genocide, or a people who were so detached from the ummah and so happy with the comfort that you have that you thought, you know what, yes, he punished a genocide, but we were real politique. We were political thinkers who thought long term. We thought 20,000 Palestinians, but we were smart. We still voted for Biden because we want to build influence and leverage like we've been doing for 30 years that proved absolutely useless when it came to stopping this genocide. We went to all the White House iftars and we made the links, we made the contacts. We were there in the circles of power because if we're not on the table, we're on the menu. We went to them and we said, we 30 years we had no leverage, but 10 years more after genocide, this will be the turning point where we can have leverage. Where next time we can say to the president, please, ya rais, please, ya prince, please, please don't do genocide. Please, listen, you guys will vote for us anyway. Please, I need to give me something to take back to my community. Take them that Trump wants to do the Muslim ban and that will satisfy them. Can I have a bit more, please? Tell him that we'll do a counter Islamophobia initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Massa. Thank you. Astaghfirullah. Astaghfirullah. You can tell how upset, how upset I am. How upset and how angry I am that there are some in this community who are still asking what if when it is put before them, let's punish genocide Joe. And they reply and say, what if? Shame. Shame and ar that 20,000 Palestinians can be killed and you are in a position to punish genocide Joe. And still some members of the community say, what if? Ibadullah. We are an ummah of justice. 
We are an ummah that stands for justice. And we are ummah ready to struggle for justice. And November, inshallah, you will show that to the world. And when Genocide Joe, inshallah, is toppled, the views expressed are mine. I'm just giving them a scenario here. When Genocide Joe is punished, and I received the messages, bro, did you see it? These Muslims, they did it. These American Muslims that we all thought were liberal and pro-LGBT because there's a speaker who introduced us to them and convinced us that you were all pro-LGBT. In any case, and then I discovered in America that you weren't. In any case, Sammy, these, the, Muslim, the American Muslims, they did it. They did it. What did they do? What did they do? They toppled Genocide Joe. And everybody will say it's because of the Muslim vote. And the world will say that Biden, the President of the United States of America, messed up so badly that Israel is on trial for genocide and he lost the second term and the Muslims are celebrating and the Muslims are shouting and saying that we toppled genocide Joe and we toppled him for Palestine because yeah genocide Joe you tried to erase Palestine we kept it alive we kept moving for Palestine and we will tell you loud and clear when they bring those ballot boxes I'm gonna watch that news reporter and it appears that many ballots on the ballot box didn't even have a candidate on them they said they wrote free Palestine and one person, we have it right here, it says, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And then everybody will repeat it like, hashtag, we become like a meme. And I will say, Allahumma, make me like those American Muslims. Allahumma, celebrate those American Muslims and lift them and celebrate them. But if Genocide Joe wins because the Muslims choose not to punish him, we'll be like, alhamdulillah, we're not like those humiliated American Muslims. Ya Rabba, may Allah help them deal with them. Barakallahu feekam and apologies for taking too long. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm fine. Like I can stay as long as you want, but it's up to you guys. Whenever you guys are tired, Bismillah. I'm fine. Alhamdulillah. Not just the ballot box. You know, if you really organize well, and I don't know if you'll be able to do this. Not because it's not possible, but because I don't know if the Ummah will be able to organize properly for this. Like I mean, the Americans here. You know, there's a way you can punish Biden at the presidential election and deny Trump the house. But you can punish Biden in the presidential election, make sure he loses, and you can deny Trump control of the House, which would require you to identify the areas where you can actually make a difference. I was shocked to discover that there are some areas where the candidate in the last election won by like 2,000 votes in an area with 10,000 registered Muslims, of which only 2,000 Muslims went to vote, which means the 8,000 Muslims who didn't vote could have tipped the favor one way or the other. Now, for these people, I always say that, you know, there's an ayah in the Quran, Wallahu laysa abid. Allah is not oppressive to his believers. So sometimes when you find a humiliated people, there's a reason they've been humiliated. And often it's because Allah gave them the ability to do something to make change, and they chose not to deploy that power to make change. That's why when Allah told Musa alayhi salam to tell his people to go to enter the area, to enter where Jerusalem is, and they said, well, we won't go because there's a powerful people there. The odds are against us. The world is against us. We can't do it. And he said, Allah has given you the order. And they replied sarcastically, mocking him. They said, إذهب أنت وربك فقاتل إنها هنا قاعدون. If Allah has said it, go you and your Lord and fight. We'll be here waiting and we'll see what happens. And Allah says he forbade them from entering it for 40 years. Because there are people who didn't deserve to do it. The reason why I'm saying that is because there is a way to punish Biden in the presidential election. And a way to mobilize Muslims and those who, people of conscience who are rallying for Palestine, those Jewish groups that shut down Congress, that went into sitting in Congress, the African Americans who are turning away from Israel, all these groups, there's a way you can identify, because the Muslim at the end of the day is not Democrat or Republican, the Muslim votes based on the causes, the Muslim mobilizes based on causes, Ali ibn Abi Talib said that we don't judge causes based on who stands with them, we judge men and women based on, who, based on whether they stand with just causes. And I noticed earlier when he said the men, women and over there, and I thought it's very reflective of America, you know, pronouns, he, she, they. But in any case, I just thought it was quite funny. Just kind of, so. In any case, the point here being is that if you really mobilize, if you really calculate the data, you could viably from February to March gather the data that you need to identify the areas in California where you can make a difference. And there are some areas where you actually can. I've seen some of the numbers. Then you can spend March till June gathering the resources and mashallah, you guys have a lot of those resources. Then you can spend June, July, August training your communication strategies or the like, your hashtags, get your accounts ready or the like. Then September information blitz to remind an ummah that might forget that a genocide took place earlier in the year and then by November you're ready. The reality is the Zionists already have a plan like this already set. They know what they're doing, they know where they're going, they know the message they're doing, they know the areas where they're contesting and they know where they're going to punish.
The Muslims are ready to do something, but they do not have the strategy yet to be able to do it. Ibadullah, having will is not enough. You need to move also and mobilize. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that when my believers take one step towards me, I take ten towards them. If they walk towards me, I come running. The reason why is we, Allah is emphasizing the idea of taking the action in order to mobilize. How many of you know areas where you can contest and you can actually make a difference in California? And this is where I give rather a bit of a dark message. Ibadullah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sometimes He gives opportunities, but that doesn't mean you will take those opportunities. The fact that you have the chance to punish Biden doesn't mean you will. Because to take that chance, you need to move, act, mobilize, and struggle. You need to give from your time to volunteer. You need to give from your money to sponsor those where you might say, I went to, for example, to some places where they said, Semi, our state is not a swing state. It's dead set going to vote Biden. And one of them stood up and said, but I have an idea, Semi. I said, what's your idea? He said, we're an affluent community in this particular city. This is not California, it's another city. He goes, we can gather resources to send 12, 20, 30, 40 people to help the brothers in Michigan or to help those in Arizona where it's a swing state. We can pool our resources the way Zionists do to push for teams to do so. Tech guys from San Francisco said we'd be willing to go fly out to these other places to help them with their tech campaigns, the local tech campaigns. Because I don't know how to make an app. But I do know that people are willing to entertain this. I remember after Atlanta when I spoke, and the reason why I say Atlanta, I was so happy to speak in actual swing state. Not that I'm doing anything in this country, everything within the law. A man of 75 years of age came to me and said to me, Sammy, look, Elon Musk has blocked my Twitter account. And he said, we have suspended your account for three days because we think you're a bot. I told him, Haji, what happened? He said, I never had social media, but I saw your video and you said retweet, like, and it all makes a difference. So I asked my grandson to set me an account on Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. But I don't know how to use it. So on the TikTok, on, the, on Twitter, I was just retweeting and liking everything that the Palestinians were doing, like you said. But now they've blocked me. I told him, but Haji, can I just ask a question? He said, what? I told him, did you actually tweet, though? He goes, why would I tweet? You said just retweet and like. I said, yeah, but Haji, like, you got to retweet. You got to tweet so they know you're a person and then do the retweeting. He goes, well, what do I tweet? I have nothing to say. I don't know, why don't you just write in the morning, good morning, and in the evening, good night. <laughs> the reason why I tell you this story is to show you, Ya Ibadullah, do we have a strategy to simplify the information to such an extent that those who are desperate to do something for Palestine are able to do it? Some people don't need the complicated strategy. Some people just need simple instructions on what to do. Those of you who are involved in tech, I'm in California, there's a lot of tech guys, right? I've seen other minority groups set up apps where all you have to do is put your postcode or zip code, as you guys call it here. Put your zip code. And it gives you the details exactly of who was pro ceasefire and who was against ceasefire and what candidate most people are going towards. Tech guys, have you got the information yet to do an app for it? Activists, have you given the information to the tech guys? YouTubers, TikTok, social media people, have you got the information so you can break it down, so we can retweet and share those one minute, two minute clips so we can inform the community? No, no, and no. Next question. I think when it comes to the first question with regards to Saudi Arabia, Mufti Taqi Usmani, I've, I've heard they, they're saying that he gave, he said that if those of you thinking of doing Umrah, you should give that money to Gaza instead. I mean, some people have suggested that they should boycott Umrah. The reason why I'm against it is for two reasons. The first is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam wanted to do Umrah when Mecca was under Quraysh. Albeit there was a political reason for it as well, which is to show that they were committed to performing the ritual, ritual rites and asserting their claim to Mecca when Quraysh were involved in Mecca. Nevertheless, I think that's also a precedent that we do, that Umrah continues regardless. The second reason why I'm against boycotting Umrah, not, it's not a hard position. I'm not saying against in the sense that I'm fully convinced. But I'm just thinking out loud here. Now, for those of you who actually follow football, football. Someone said soccer. Although I read, someone told me recently that soccer actually came from the British. It's, it's from the abbreviation. So the British are the ones who misguided you and then you know, led you astray. But, I, no, but also, I do realize, you Americans are too quick with abbreviations. America is all abbreviations. Brother, are you going to SYVP? Uh, uh, listen, you know the organization WMP, and you know this, uh, S and I'm like, I, do, I, don't, I can't follow this conversation. Like, just give the proper names here, Jamal. In any case, in football, the Ballon d'Or winner last year, which is the best player in the world, was an Algerian. 
Karim Benzema. Lovely, lovely player, mashallah. Majestic, elegant in the way that he plays. So Karim Benzema, the Saudis made him a lucrative offer and he went to move to Saudi Arabia. But he didn't move to Riyadh, to Al Hilal, he moved to Jeddah. And he specifically said, if I move to Saudi, I need to move to Jeddah. Then he gave an interview to The Athletic. Because for me, a lot of people say, Sammy, what do you read to keep up to date? I'll be honest with you, at breakfast, I read the football gossip about who's moving where and who's going, whatever. And I read The Athletic and I read it in depth. Like, I love football. When I got married, I said to my wife, Yes, Umayya, look, Saraha, yani. Alhamdulillah, I don't have any of these like vices that you know you should be worried about. This football is sacred, yani. And if there's a if there's a match tonight or, or Champions League or Arsenal are playing or the like, I told the plea, and I'm not asking anything from you, but in those moments, just give me my space, please. Because Arsenal tend to lose quite often. You know, like in any case, Karim Benzema, when he went to Jeddah, he gave an interview to the Athletic and they asked him, Why did you move to Jeddah? He said, Because I'm Muslim and I wanted to be close to Mecca. And the Bin Salman Twitter army were so upset. They were so angry. They said, what does it mean coming to Jeddah for Mecca? Is all Saudi has is Mecca Medina? Someone needs to tell Benzema why we're spending so much money to bring him here. And they went, Nala. when I saw how angry they was, in Algeria we have a concept called Skara. Now Skara means that, you know when you have somebody who's stronger than you that you can't be, but you've discovered something that when you do it really annoys them. So for example, when your older brother hits you, I don't have an older brother, I was the older brother, but I didn't do the hitting. I just realized I put myself, no. In any case, but let's say, for example, an older brother is hitting the younger sibling. And you know the, guy, and the other sibling goes, you're stupid. Don't call me stupid. You're dumb. No, don't call me dumb. You're, but you know it hurts them. So you keep doing it, scarafi, because it annoys them. My conclusion was that because Bin Salman's people were so upset that Benzema went to Jeddah for Mecca and Medina, because more people go to Mecca and Medina than they go to Iggy Azalea's raves, I think people should continue going to Umrah, scarafi, Bin Salman. Like scara. So that Bin Salman, no matter how much he does Vision 2030, he cannot get rid of the Islamic identity of Saudi Arabia. He can build whatever projects he wants, whatever cities he wants. Saudi will always be the land of the two holy mosques. Whatever, even if he decides to change the history from 1744 to 1727, and he does a new emblem where he says Saudi is represented by the logo of a horse, the logo of a sug, a market, the logo of a date, and the logo of whatever, and a flag that has nothing on it. Even when he does all of that, the Muslims remind him. So I think that with, with Saudi, in terms, uh, that, that's the, in, in that particular case, I'm not sure that it's keen to boycott them. You mentioned the issue of being silent on Saudi Arabia. And I will give you a personal answer. While I would like the Ummah to be loud about bin Salman's demonization process on Saudi Arabia, one of the things that I'm not sure about is whether my way of going about it was the right way, which is to be loud about Saudi Arabia and talk about it. Because I can't lie to you, I'm the kind of guy on my Facebook or Instagram, when I see anyone put a picture of the Kaaba, I do snooze for 30 days. When I see anybody post a picture, I've landed in Mecca, like to go and do Umrah or the like, I do snooze this account for 30 days. When I see people taking pictures, I'm in the Kaaba, Allah has given me the blessing. I'm not the person who says, MashaAllah, I'm a person who does snooze for 30 days. It hurts me that people can go and I can't go. It hurts that when my Saudi friends, who, who love me sincerely, they come to London, they won't have coffee because they say in Bin Salman's era, you can be guilty by association. I don't know if I want the Ummah to have this particular pain. Wallahi, if I had known in 2014 that that would be the final time that I would pray in the Haramain for that long period of time, it's been almost 10 years. If I had known, I wouldn't have prayed Fajr in the hotel, I would have prayed it in the masjid. If I had known that I, would not, that I would get to a stage where I don't even go over their airspace, they want to fly me to Australia. I told them no transit in any Gulf state, not even Qatar. No transit. I would rather fly to Tokyo and go down, or fly to California and then cross the sea. I don't know if anybody in the Ummah should go through that. I'm trying to think of a better way to apply pressure on Saudi Arabia, and unfortunately, I'm not the most intelligent individual. I, do, I can't think of a better way to do it. I think maybe there are better battles to start with, such as Imran Khan, who is in prison in Pakistan, for example. Imran Khan is in prison for the only reason is that they think he will win the next election and that he will have the power of the people to support him. And that's such a horrible crime in Pakistan that they put him in prison. Now, I think that if the Ummah was loud about Imran Khan, I think they can get him released in prison. And I'll tell you why. When Imran Khan was toppled in a vote of no confidence, I had never spoken about Pakistan before. I was like, whatever, like Pakistan, Pakistan, India cricket match. They call it a sport. I don't know why it's a sport, but in any case. 
I know the English made it, who is a wise guy wants to say it. I think the English made it just because, you know, they didn't want to exert too much effort. Oh, I dare say, let's bowl the ball. And the person goes, oh, I dare say that's a six. <laughs> it's not like football, run, run. In any case, when Imran Khan was toppled in a vote of no confidence, I got a phone call from the South Africa Broadcasting Center. And they said to me, Sammy, we want to do an interview with you about what happened in Imran Khan. I told them, guys, like, I can give you numbers of Pakistani analysts. They said, no, 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 we want you. I said, guys, like, I honestly, like, I don't think it's my position to talk about Pakistan. They said, no, 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 we want you. I said, khalas, yalla. And I was like, who's going to watch it anyway? And I, I respect South Africa Broadcasting Center, but I don't think it's going to go viral. So I gave my opinion. He's been toppled because he wanted to suggest a successor for the chief of staff and the intelligence. And they were so horrified that a democratic elected prime minister would even think for a second that he has the power to tell the establishment to do anything. Somebody from PTI cut the clip and it went viral like online. And then I got establishment people calling me, telling me stay out of Pakistan's business. And then I saw Pakistani sharing the video. And I saw establishment getting upset. And as a North African whose blood can be a bit hot tempered sometimes, I said given that they're upset by it, and given they're telling me not to do it, I decided to keep talking about Imran Khan. Skara <laughs> I believe that if the Ummah roars about Imran Khan, they can get him released. Some people, they tell me, yeah, but Samuel, we don't know the internal politics. Maybe, you know, some people are saying because of the economic policies or politics. I tell them, guys, if Imran Khan was toppled because of his internal politics, fine. But he wasn't. He was toppled only because they think he's going to win the next election. And yes, CD, let's suppose because of the he do the election and let him lose the election. And khalas, we'll all be quiet. But this Ummah isn't an Ummah that stands for the rest of its body. It stands for Palestine because Allah gave it a special status in the Quran. But many Muslims don't know that the Bosnians are under pressure from the Serbians who are threatening another war. Some Muslims celebrated when Russia invaded Ukraine. They said, multipolar world, Putin. I was in Sarajevo. When I was in Sarajevo, when Putin invaded, they said if Putin enters Kiev in two weeks, the Serbs will invade and try to commit another genocide against us Bosnians. Sami explained to us why this Ummah is Jahla and doesn't understand our situation here in Bosnia. I said, Wallahi Jahla, please forgive them, may Allah guide them. How many of you know that Uzbekistan is now shaking off the chains of Soviet Russia and Putin is so upset that Erdogan is encouraging it? That the Putin is trying to send more troops now to some of these former Soviet states in order to warn them not to re-Islamize and to stay on the course on Soviet Russia. But the reason being is that these states are believed that more Muslims are going to these countries, which gives them an opportunity to re-Islamize. And if more Muslim money is poured into these economies, they can liberate themselves from Russia. But instead you choose to go to only Morocco, Dubai, Malaysia, and what's the other place? Uh, Turkey. Because they're safe places. So when you say silence about bin Salman, I think there are battles that are worth fighting at this moment in time, such as Imran Khan or the like, and to raise awareness, and, to, and everybody should be tweeting hashtag Imran Khan. Just do it randomly, it's Qara, just trust me on it. But I think with Saudi Arabia, on a personal front, and this is why when students, they come and they say, I want to do what you do, like talk about politics, I tell them, I don't think you do, you know. I don't think you want to condemn yourself to, you know, being shut out from many of these Muslim nations, and then watch your friends go back and forth and put pictures up about it. Having said that, and I'll finish on this point, there's nothing that frightens bin Salman more than English-speaking Muslims talking about Saudi Arabia. Because English-speaking Muslims affect his image in the capitals that he wants to impress. And English-speaking Muslims, for those who don't know, if you look at the statistics of the largest populations on earth, English-speaking Muslims are the fifth largest population on earth. The number one population is China, two, uh, no, the number one population is Muslims, two point something billion. Then it's China, one point something billion. Then it's India, one point something billion. Then I think it's the US, 360 million. And then it's English speaking Muslims, 330 million. That's America, Europe, bits of North Africa, Middle East, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, and India. English speaking Muslims are the fifth largest population on earth. If English speaking Muslims raised awareness for issues to do with the Ummah everywhere, collectively, can you imagine the impact they would have? But unfortunately, the Ummah doesn't pay attention to its memories 
It hasn't reconnected its memories. And that's why I argue that the greatest tragedy of this ummah when it comes to colonization wasn't the physical colonization. It was the way colonization ripped the limbs of its ummah so that we no longer paid attention to the affairs of each other. Where we started respecting the borders that were imposed on us by saying we won't talk about issues that are outside of these borders. Whereas you read Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Kathir and these old scholars that you celebrate and they're talking about politics from Morocco all the way to Jakarta and beyond as if, they, as if it's just one place, as if it's just normal for a Muslim to know about these affairs. And some people will say, how do I reconnect with those memories? In my opinion, you reconnect with those memories by going out to those countries. Many of you will say you haven't been to Bosnia, but you've been to Switzerland. Bosnia is Switzerland views, but all halal and cheaper. But because you're not connected to the Bosnian community, you decided to put your money in an economy that hates you instead of an economy that desperately needs you. And some of you might be thinking, Sammy, like you're giving us these little, like whatever, like examples, that kind of thing. I'll tell you an interesting story, and I promise I'll, I'll hand over here. You know, sometimes a shape is shape, youthkar, and please tolerate me just, just for this particular one. I'm aware sometimes, you know, some, my, 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 my family, sometimes they say, Sammy, he goes through the gears. One first gear, and then he goes straight to fifth gear. <laughs> when we, so we have like three, four itineraries for Bosnia. So eventually the tourism board reached out to us, and they said to us, you do trips to Bosnia, but you only do Mostar and Sarajevo and everything in between. Why don't you do beyond like Western Bosnia? We said we don't have the resources to go and explore it. They said, we'll pay for you to go and explore Western Bosnia. We'll go all those thousand kilometers and go and explore it. We said, okay, fine. They sent the itinerary. They included a city called Banja Luka. Banja Luka, for those who don't know, in 1993 had 18 masajid. The ethnocentric Serbs that committed the genocide destroyed all 18 mosques turned the ruins into garbage dumps, and then when the gar smell got too badly, they made it into parking lots so that they could say that we're always stepping on Islam, and that we won here. When I saw it on the list, I told my wife, I told her, oh, with my dead body, I'm going Banja Luka. I'm not going, no way. I'm not betraying my Bosnian brothers and sisters by going. I read about it, I read Ali Zabegovic's book, I know the Bosnian history, I'm not going. She told me, Shh, be quiet, he can hear you. I said, I'm not going, I'm not going, no, no, no. She told me, let's just go see it. And then the guy heard me. He said, Sammy, let's just go see it. Just have a look at it. We won't stay the night there. I'm not going, Banu Sammy, let's go see it. I'm not going, Banu And then my wife, as all wives do, put her foot down. We're going. And I was like, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. <laughs> so we're driving. And for those who don't know Bosnia, Bosnia, basically the roads are literally up a mountain, down a mountain, up a mountain, down a mountain. There's a joke they say in Bosnia. They say, if Allah ironed Bosnia, it would be the size of the United States. <laughs> so on the way going to Banja Luka, I'm going, astaghfirullah, 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 Allah, I'm, I'm, I'm a traitor, I'm so weak. Yeah, astaghfirullah, I'm going, Banya Luka. And then we go around the place and then we see Banya Luka, it starts to appear. First thing you see is a minaret. We stop by the Farhadiyah Masjid. We walk in, the Imam comes out, and I do what Sami does, he puts his foot in it. I go in, I go, the Imam says, Salaamu Alaikum. I was like, Imam, what are you doing here? He said, what do you mean, what am I doing here? This is, uh, this is Banya Luka. He says, okay, and? Where did this come from? He says, in 2002, he was 22 years old. The Bosniak community, the Muslims, their hearts were broken that the Masajid in Banja Luka had been destroyed and they felt that the Mladic and Karatsic who committed the genocide could claim that they achieved their aims by kicking out Islam from Banja Luka. So with their limited resources, because they're not a rich economy, they gathered money together, pulled money together to send this Imam of 22 years of age to Banja Luka with a quest to rebuild the 18 Masajid. I said to him, but how did they let you do it? He said they didn't initially, the local government, because they created a semi-autonomous area in northern Bosnia called the Republika Srpska. He said, so one Bosnian had an idea. He said, why don't we go to UNESCO and we ask what are the conditions to protect the Masajid under UNESCO for UNESCO conditions. UNESCO said 90% have to be original materials. Look at my ummah. They gather the money to buy the parking lots. They dig up the parking lots, they dig up the original materials. They re UNESCO says it has to rebuild as it was before. They rebuild the masjid as it was before. They go to Turkey, they find the original plans and they go and they rebuild the masjid. They have rebuilt 17 of the 18. They built a madrasa alongside it. 
And I said to him, what made you go to do all of this? And I'm sitting in the masjid going, Wallah majahil. I don't have foresight. I don't have whatever. Look at these people. These are heroes of the ummah. The ummah is not weak. I'm weak. The ummah is not jahla. I'm jahil. The ummah is brave and strong. I'm the one who's weak and pathetic. I said, and he says to me, the imam, he looks at me and he goes to me, Mladic and Karasic said they would kick Islam out of Banya Luka. Sami, we are here. They will never turn off the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I told them, Wallah, I'll bring people to Banya Luka. I will bring the Muslims to Banya Luka. I will include it on the itineraries. Sumaya, Sumaya, we have to include it on the itineraries. The Muslims have to come to Banya Luka. They have to come to the madrasa. They have to come whatever. And then when I calmed down a bit, I said, but Ya Allah, what if the Muslims struggle with, by, with the local community? As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had heard my concern. We're walking down the boulevard. It's really beautiful. And the woman sees Sumaya, and Sumaya wears hijab and abaya. So she stops Sumaya, she grabs it, she says, excuse me, where are you from? She says, I'm half English, half Algerian. I've gone. And she says, oh, Algeria. And she told us a funny joke. I can't remember, but it was about Mother Teresa, alcohol in Algeria. I think he said, yeah, I can't remember. Anyway, it was a funny joke. Anyway, and she says, by the way, I just want to tell you, you're more than welcome here. I said, like, Allah? And then there was a huge protest that just suddenly emerged in the boulevard. A huge protest against the separatist, racist Serb leader of Republika Srpska. And being Sami, I went, Allahumma, message received. Message received. The reason why I tell you the story is to explain to you why that there are Ummah, in the Ummah there are so many projects similar to this that require support of the Ummah, the backing. These were Bosniaks gathering money. And do you know who also helped them, by the way? Christian, Irish Christians. They sent money to help them as well. This is what I mean by the Ummah is not connected to its memories. Imagine if the Ummah had heard about the story and how much they would have supported it. And for those of you who think that you're not valuable in terms of where you choose to travel, there is a hotel near in Sarajevo where they used to hold the Winter Olympics. It's run by a Christian Serb and it's all halal. They did an interview with him. They said to him, why are you a Christian Serb and you have an all halal hotel? And he said, because all my clients are Muslims. They spend money. They're not like you stingy lot. When I see that tourism boards, non-Muslim tourism boards approach us and they say we want a piece of this $320 billion Muslim market that is 11% of the world travel market, what do we need to get Muslims to come? And the Koreans, they, we say to them that, you know, they want halal meat and they go, halal, halal, what is halal? Halal is just Muslim. Where can we get halal? You can just order it. So if you just get halal meat, Muslims will come. They had an initiative last year called Halal Week in November, which lasted one month. Halal week, they identified that in November, that's when thousands of Muslims would go to Korea. And so in that month, around 35% of Korea's restaurants would swap the haram meat and use halal meat to welcome the Muslims into Seoul. And they would get chefs who would do live performances of how to make Korean dishes with halal meat to welcome the Muslims. When we spoke to Barbados, they said, we want Muslims to come. We said, yeah, but halal meat is hard to get by. They said, what's halal meat? Oh, it's just the meat. They would just give us two weeks notice and the Hilton will produce halal meat for you. Just let us know when you're coming. Really, is that simple? Yeah. Your beaches are full of bikinis. They said, is that a problem? We said, well, it's a big problem. I'm just saying. Okay, we'll just cut off a section of the beach and make it a family area. We'll just leave it for the Muslim. That easy, that easy. Spanish tourism board. We gave a presentation last year. We, we, we were arguing that the next stage of Muslim travel is city tourism instead of nation tourism. The English people sometimes, they go Paris six days, for example. We believe that there are cities in the Muslim world, like Cordoba, like Bukhara, like, that deserve five days. But the reason why, there's a lack of infrastructure and investment to keep them there for five days. So the Spanish Tourism Board said, do you think you could do this for Cordoba? Because when people say they visit Andalusia, they say, I spent two days in Sevilla, one day in Cordoba, two days in Granada. They think it's a big thing, but it sounds like they just went to fill up gas in Cordoba and they just passed the city. When we did it for them, we thought there would be backlash. The church was upset. They said, why are they investing so much in halal tourism? Spanish tourism board said, look, we're in an economic crisis. These Muslims spend money. We want them to come. We're ready to give them halal meat. And also the hotels, they're ready to get halal certification. And two hotels already have halal certification because they want Muslims to come and spend their money. Sometimes we think that resistance is only in speaking out. And this is why I wanted to get to this point. Sometimes we think resistance is speaking out. But what I've learned sometimes is that there are battles that are fought in all different domains that make an impact overall. I've seen 
two nations agreed to invest in a city in Uzbekistan. They agreed to invest, I think it was about 10 million. I was invited as an independent consultant because Sumaya couldn't go. She told me, go in my place. They agreed that they should invest in this city. What they're arguing over is whether they should call it the Islamic capital of Uzbekistan or the Uzbek capital. Or, sorry, the Islamic cultural capital of Uzbekistan or the Uzbek cultural capital of Uzbekistan. One side, backed by Erdogan, says, I'm not putting my money in unless you call it the Islamic cultural capital. The other side, European side, is saying, I'm not putting my money in unless it's called the Uzbek cultural capital. I saw and I thought, subhanAllah, wars are fought in so many different ways. So you are asking about Umrah. I think that if the numbers of Mecca and Medina always surpass the concerts, it will hurt bin Salman. He won't be happy about the money because the money will, that he gets from Hajj and Umrah, to be honest, is only 5%. And he's still struggling economically because it's overwhelmingly of the oil. So really, when you say you're benefiting him in economic, you're not really doing much with your Umar and Hajj in terms of benefiting him economically by going to Umar and Hajj. It hurts him when he goes because it shows that while he's trying to attract you with, not you specifically with Iggy Zaley, I think he used Pitbull or David Guetta to do that. But in any case, the point is, while he's doing all of that, none of you are going to these concerts. And the minority that do are going afterwards to make Toba and Mecca Medina because they think that's how it works. <laughs> no, really, listen, I heard, uh, this is not a joke, I, I, I was actually told this. After the Gaza genocide, there is a brother who is, you know, has some vices, and he went to his local imam and he said, you know, imam, you've been telling me that if I don't stop, I'm going to go to Jahannam. You're a liar, imam. He said, what do you mean? He goes, nothing I do compares to genocide. Hellfire wasn't made for people like me. It was made for people like those Zionists who are committing that genocide. I'm fine, I'm fine. Don't you worry about me. These people are pure evil. They not, do nothing what I do. The point that I'm making here is there are other ways in which you can make a difference, ways that you didn't think and ways that will make a difference as well. Hong Kong has a unique website only for Muslim travelers to tell Muslim travelers come. Dawah can be done in so many different ways if only you knew, if only you knew. And the final point, I promise this is the final point. I know it's a long answer to your question. I'm sorry. It's like you said, where's your ear? And I did that and I still haven't found it. But the, the point is that the final point that I will say is this. Dawah can be done in so many different ways. And the reason why I emphasize this point is that it's important to put the world into context. Yes, the Muslim world is struggling, but Islam is consistently the fastest growing religion. Yes, they are persecuting Muslims abroad, but Islam grows more and more in the belly of the beast. Yes, they are trying to wipe out Islam elsewhere, but they cannot understand why every time they do it, like they're pummeling Gaza, they can't understand why people are entering Islam when they're pummeling Gaza. They can't understand why more people enter the deen, the more they hit Islam. It's because Islam is protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I went to France and I met a French journalist. So I'm gonna do, I don't know what I'm doing. I went, I, I, it's just I'm desperate to, to really push this point. I went to France and I met a journalist. And I said to this journalist, he was like to me, you know, Sami, on our home problem, we have a huge problem. I said, c'est quoi le problème? What's the problem? This one didn't tell me, I speak English. He actually spoke to me in French. He said to me, you know, the new French generation, the heroes of the Muslim in Golo Kante. The Muslim Karim Benzema, the Muslim Zinedine Zidane, the Muslim Paul Pogba. Sammy, this is, a, this, is, this is tragic. Like the French values of like this new generation won't know what French values are. The same way the Zionists are concerned that the new generation of Americans no longer support Zionism. When they said to TikTok, we need you to restrict Palestine, TikTok said, you guys are mistaken. It's nothing to do with the algorithm. It's just the new generation are pro-Palestinian. And that's what I mean in that when you're asking about Saudi or the like, or what can you do to bin Salman? Ghassan Abu Sitta has a good podcast with a thinking Muslim, which I encourage you to watch, where he says, we survive by existing. We win by existing. We win by upholding the symbolism. Because what we're telling the world is that no matter how much you persecute and torture the Muslim Ummah, we will never give up La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, even if it means we'll get the comforts that you promise us. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is dearer to us, as Imran Khan said, is dearer, dearer, dearer to us than anything that we own and we are ready to sacrifice everything for his honor and for his Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think that when you see the power in this sentiment, a power that was reflected in Algeria when the French were, left Algeria, what hurt them so much was that they said 132 years of a civilizing mission and these Algerians still took to the streets. And when they celebrated independence, they didn't say, oh, we kicked out the French, Algeria is free. They said a special chant. They said, Ya Muhammad, Mabruk Alik. Ya Al-Jaza'ir Raj'at Lik. Oh, Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, 
They shouted, the Algerians, on independence to show you how much they love the Prophet. They shouted on the streets, Ya Muhammad, Mabrook Ali, O Prophet Muhammad, congratulations, we have returned Algeria to you. We have returned, and the French said, how is it 1400 years after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that no matter how much we persecute and commit genocide on these people, they still love this Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi more than they love our values and our culture. And bin Salman is terrified that no matter how much he de-Islamizes Saudi Arabia, this Ummah will never buy into this new vision. And more importantly, it seems the Americans aren't buying into it either, because eight years into Vision 2030, and he's still desperate to get investment, and he's still trying to offer normalization in exchange for support, because companies are going to Saudi Arabia, but they're not investing in Saudi Arabia. They're taking government checks to build his cities, but refusing to set up headquarters there, because nobody wants to live in those cities. They all want to go. I know that was a long-winded answer, but it was the only way I knew how to answer it. And build these masajid for us, and this haven, and stuff here. Yeah. I personally don't care how you vote, as long as it's not for genocide, Joe. I have mulled over from time to time whether Muslims should reach out to the Republicans at least to sound out the waters. As a guest, I can say it because I'm going back to London and to be honest, if people get upset about it, uh, I do, no problem. Right? I'm in London, you guys are here. It's, it's up to you guys what you guys do. I've felt that in some communities, in Muslim communities, it's blasphemous to even make the suggestion. What I do find interesting is that before Gaza became an issue, the issue that was really getting the Muslims going was the issue of the LGBT and trans in the schools. And I was very interested in July when Fox News reported on the Muslim parents protesting against the school in Michigan. And the Republicans covered it and Fox News and they said, look at these Muslims. And they said their version of MashaAllah. But they said, you know, look at these Muslims, how they're standing up for an issue that we believe in and we should be standing up for as well. So the Muslims led and the Republicans actually expressed sympathy for it. Many of you will have seen that documentary, even though I don't like, I, you know, I'm, Ben Shapiro and these guys and Matt Walsh and whatever. But Ali ibn Abi Talib said, like, focus on the cause, right? You've all seen that documentary, What is a Woman? And, and I can't lie to you, I felt like it was in a dystopia. He asked one question, what is a woman? And I've never seen people do so many semantic gymnastics just to... He even goes to a woman's march and says, what is a woman? And they can't answer it. Like, what world do we live in? The point is, it was clear before July that there was common ground within which the Republicans were showing some sort of admiration for the Muslim community. Having said that, they're all really hardcore Zionists. So I don't know how to navigate that field. What I do know is that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the first 13 years of his da'wah, every Hajj season would go to every tent to look for a tribe that would support him or to deliver his message to each tribe. And for 13 years he would be rejected each Hajj season until he met Aus al-Khazraj. My question is, did it demean the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to keep going to those tents even though Quraysh used to laugh at him for it? No, it didn't. Some people are really going to lambast him. It's going to be like he used the Prophet ﷺ to justify talking to Republicans. The nerve. No, no, no. But I'm going to stick to it. Because I believe that the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, when he gave his da'wah, he gave it to everybody, including Ubay ibn Salul, who was the head of the hypocrites, knowing full well he was the hypocrite. And I also know that in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about da'wah, we always talk about the first ayah, not the following ayah. Allah says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّا دَعِي لَاللَّهُ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Is there any better speech than one who calls to Allah, does good deeds, and say, I am from the Muslims, but we never read the following ayah when we mention it, which is, وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيَّةُ The good deed and the bad deed are not equal, suggesting that when you give this da'wah and do good deeds and say you're from the Muslimin, you might receive a backlash. And Allah is saying that the bad deed and the good deed are not equal. Do not respond with the bad deed, with a bad deed. Remember to uphold the integrity and principle of the good deed. And Allah says, Idfa' billati hiya ahsan, afterwards. Idfa' means two things in this ayah. Idfa' means conduct yourself and idfa' also means push back. Idfa', idfa' al-bab, push the door. Idfa' billati hiya ahsan, push back with that which is best, strategically. Because Allah says, He tells you why. 
فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم For it may be the one with whom you have enmity with today The one who is your enemy today Tomorrow becomes your warmest ally And Allah tells you who achieves this وَمَا يُلَقَاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا The ones who achieve this are the ones who are patient Patience here Allah is defining it not as patience sitting at home Patience with the process of da'wah to somebody who hates you, who is your enemy. And Allah is saying, if you show perseverance in this da'wah, Allah will make it so the one who is your enemy today, tomorrow becomes your warmest ally. Those who have a great blessing, meaning Allah's intervention is what results in the enemy becoming a warmest ally. I'm going to say something that will sound blasphemous to the Muslim community. I think there is merit, despite Trump's rhetoric on Israel and Zionism, to sound out some of the Republican candidates. Because I saw Tucker Carlson, I don't watch him, I don't watch him, I don't watch Tucker Carlson, I don't encourage people to watch him, I don't watch him, don't judge me. But I've heard and I've seen clips of Tucker Carlson and Republicans asking why on earth are we spending so much money supporting the Zionists? Asking why on earth are we allowing the Israelis to drag us into these conflicts? Which shows the Republicans are not united when it comes. They may be united in Zionism. They are not united in their support for Zionism. I think there is room there. If someone asks me as a political analyst to lay out the groundwork, I would say that there is room at least to explore the potential opportunity to talk. No imam, in my opinion at this moment is brave enough to take the lead because the Muslim community, you know, we're really good at just tearing people down. We're very merciful for red pill movements and that kind of thing, but we're very horrible to our own who take the step forward and try to do something. You know, the Zionists, they invest 10 times in a failure because they know the 11th time he creates Google. We invest one time he fails and we tell him never again. Yeah, community, don't invest in him. Even though we read in the seerah that when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Khalid ibn Walid to a tribe, Khalid ibn Walid achieved his mission but transgressed. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is on record as saying, Allahumma inni abra'u ilayka mimma fa'ala Khalid. Allah, I'm innocent of what Khalid has done. The ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at that time, they saw Khalid ibn Walid do Tawbah, they sent him back out with the army. The ummah of today, I fear, would probably have said to Khalid, radiallahu anhu, Ya Khalid, we ain't never letting, never letting you lead an army again. Did you see what the Prophet sallallahu said about you? You think we're ever going to let you lead an army after what the Prophet Sallallahu said about you in the hadith? And if ever a minority said, Yeah, Khadim Walid, you are talented, go and lead the army, probably we would have had some Imams who say, Don't do it. The Prophet Sallallahu said in the hadith, I'm innocent of what Khalid has done. I am innocent of what Khalid does. Astaghfirullah al -Azim. That's why I think sometimes it's strange that the Ummah can read something and say, MashaAllah, that the Prophet sent Khalid out. But when one of our Imams makes a mistake and makes tawbah, we cancel him and make sure that he's never allowed to take the initiative again. That's why when you're asking the question now what you should do with your vote, the views expressed are the speaker's own and do not reflect the organization. I'm not telling you how to vote. I'm encouraging you to come to the conclusion on your own so people, in a way that people can say, Sami didn't tell you. But if I was in your position, if Sami was an American citizen, God save the king. If Sami was an American citizen, he would punish Genocide Joe. And given that there's still time until November, he would explore the divisions amongst the Republicans with regards to their stance on Israel. And he would try to take a few Muslims just to sit down and have coffee. And he would say to himself, Rasulullah sallallahu used to go to the tents in Hajj. And he didn't have an army or power and he was ridiculed by Quraysh. Let the Ummah ridicule me. If they want to be like Quraysh, let them be like Quraysh. Let them ridicule me. See what I did there? Let them ridicule me. And let me go and sound out the Republicans. La asa, la alla wa asa. Maybe, 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 maybe. I discover they're not as united on Israel as they seem to be. And they will say to the Muslims, you promised to punish Biden. And maybe we can work together on other issues. I don't know if it will work. What I do know is this, and I promise this is the final sentence. I promise, I promise. What I do know is this, Ya Ibadallah. We may not punish genocide Joe even if we try. It may well be Allah has written something different. Musa alayhi salam and Khidr. Musa has one interpretation of a situation and he denounces it. Khidr has a different because he knows the unknown. Musa is not necessarily wrong alayhi salam, but Allah is showing he's in charge 
and he guides the outcome as he wishes. I don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in terms of the outcome. What I do know is that my intention is to punish genocide Joe for the sake of the Palestinians in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah to make my path easy to achieve the justice and to give me the wisdom to identify where the correct path is. And if this path will lead to harm, to guide me in a way off this path, even if I continue to go on it. That's what I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do. Because the outcome belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately. What I'm saying to you here is not that you will punish genocide, Joe. I'm telling you to strive for justice for the Palestinians because Allah has said the striving is appreciated, not the outcome. Allah has said the striving and mobilization for the sake of justice is what Allah appreciates because Allah is in charge of the and I trust that whatever happens Allah will choose the best outcome for the Muslims even if we are going in the wrong way Allah will guide us I'm convinced of this so based on my limited understanding of politics and what I have now Wallahi if genocide Joe wins the second term after committing a genocide I feel I will be a humiliated ummah and I won't be able to look myself in the mirror and I won't be able to look Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the face when somebody in, in his companionship in Al Firdaus inshallah if we ever get there inshallah I hope we get there if somebody in his companionship say so genocide Joe you guys had the power to punish him why didn't you what am I supposed to say Rasulullah ya Rasulullah Allah, I told them to do so but you know they just felt it was a bit no, no, I want a face that says, Ya Rasulullah, even if he wasn't punished, I did everything that I could and I'm proud of what I did. That's why I meant by, and this is why I finish on this particular point. Your choice, there are four years, Ijaf, four years of difficulty coming, whether it's Biden or Trump. The choice for you is this, do you want to go through those four years with dignity or do you want to go through those four years humiliated? I believe dignity matters. November, you will show me whether it matters to you, inshallah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar.